Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I want to remind us all that we had uh, our, our drum and prayer yesterday, and those good spirits are still with us today. We had an absolutely fantastic conversation yesterday, and I can hear the buzz and the excitement and the energy continuing in the room today. So we have a full day, a really fantastic agenda, and uh, we'll get it off, we'll start it off in a good way again. So I want to remind everyone that we are uh, live streaming and we're taping this. So in a few minutes, uh, we will go live and uh, we will have comments from our president, Neil Kashkari. But first, I'd like to have Dick Todd, who is sort of the originator of this conference, to come up and uh, give us opening remarks for the day. Let's have a great day. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope everyone had a good evening. Uh, welcome to some newcomers, uh, and we look forward to a good day today. I'm not, I'm not going to give very long opening remarks because I want to get right into it with President Kashkari. So our first speaker today will be Neil Kashkari, who's been president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank since January of 2016. I've enjoyed working with him. I think uh, you'll see he's a pretty open-minded and energetic thinker. He's very committed to policy and making policy better for all of us. Uh, very driven by data and evidence, um, and keenly interested in education. His own background includes a uh, bachelor's and a master's degree at a Midwestern, large Midwestern public university, Illinois. Uh, he worked in the aerospace industry, went on to get an MBA in finance at Wharton, worked with uh, the Goldman Sachs in doing uh, West Coast work on using both his engineering and his finance training in, in the industry out there, and then went to the Treasury, where he uh, worked as the head of the uh, uh, TARP, which you may remember as the uh, Troubled Assets uh, Relief Program, I believe, um, and uh, took a lot of heat. So he's used to that, and uh, then came, uh, went back to the private sector, did a stint as running for governor in California. So he's got a very diverse background for a young guy. Um, and I think you'll hear that uh, he's very interested in education and what we're doing here today. So Neil, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dick, and good morning to everyone. About a year ago, I had the pleasure of welcoming a national audience to our Center for Indian Country Development's conference on early childhood education in Indian country. Uh, we had a conference then. Today, I'm pleased to welcome a new national audience to another CICD conference on education, this time on higher education. <clears throat> the CICD and I both believe, we both see education as potentially a great equalizer in our society. A child born into poverty who receives a good education can climb out of poverty and reach his or her full potential. But the real power of education, even beyond transforming an individual's life, is that it breaks the cycle of intergenerational poverty that continues to devastate so many families and so many communities. In that sense, this conference's focus on a community perspective is especially important. Now, I'm gonna come back to the topic of education in a moment, but let me first give you some background on the Federal Reserve System and the work of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. As part of that, I should note that the views I express here are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of the rest of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, that's a disclaimer we give in all of our public comments, so it's not just specific to this topic. The Federal Reserve System, or the Fed, is a public institution serving all of the American people. We are the nation's central bank. Our most fundamental responsibility is monetary policy in pursuit of two objectives maximum employment and stable prices. This is the so-called dual mandate that the US Congress has given for the Fed. Now the Fed has also been given significant authority as a supervisor of financial institutions and as a provider of payment services. All of these activities are common to many central banks around the world. What makes the Fed different and what brings us together here in Minneapolis today is, that the, Fed, is the Fed's decentralized structure. 104 years ago, Congress created our, the Federal Reserve, our nation's central bank. But they did something unique. They distributed the central bank across 12 regional independent Federal Reserve banks 
rather than having it all housed at the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. Congress did this to ensure that different regions of the country were directly represented in economic policymaking and so that the many local varying conditions across the United States were appropriately considered. That's literally why we have a Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, to understand and represent the economic conditions in our region, which we call the Ninth Federal Reserve District. Now, the Minneapolis Fed's charge has always included a responsibility for understanding the economies of the 45 federally recognized Indian tribes in the Ninth District. To leverage our decades of experience with tribal communities, we established the CICD in 2015 as a national resource and thought leader within the Federal Reserve System on Indian country issues across the entire country. So that's why today's conference deals with tribal communities generally across the nation, not only those in the Ninth District. Now, you may wonder, people ask me, what does education have to do with the Federal Reserve? To me, it comes back to our dual mandate, maximum employment and stable prices. Education is clearly a key determinant of employment outcomes and the economy's maximum rate of growth. People who receive more and better education tend to have more job options and lower unemployment, and they are more productive workers in our society. It is vital that we understand education if we want to understand the drivers of maximum employment. And while the Federal Reserve may not have policy tools that can directly affect education, we do have world-class independent research capabilities that might be able to help. We have researchers in the Federal Reserve System studying a wide range of economic issues, such as productivity growth, that we as the nation's central bank cannot directly influence. But if we can educate, if we can analyze education models that can help more Americans get and keep good jobs, I believe it is important that we do that research and share our findings with other policymakers. This research may help us to achieve maximum employment nationally and in places such as in many tribal communities where underemployment has been a persistent problem. Now, I also, Dick mentioned this, I also bring a personal belief in the transformative power of education and the importance of providing good education to all children. I was a pretty typical middle-class kid growing up in the Midwest, the son of immigrants, who has absolutely lived the American dream simply because I was able to get a good education at a mixture of public and private schools and universities. It is essential to our nation's future that the opportunities for quality education that I took advantage of are available to all of our youth on an equitable basis. Today, however, we see large gaps in education outcomes by race. This conference will focus on higher education outcomes for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Their outcomes have improved in recent decades, but remain far too low, far too below those, for example, of non-Hispanic whites. In many ways, the American higher education system is the envy of the world and I and many others have benefited from its array of choices and high quality. However, we must know more about why a system that works so well for so many simultaneously leaves behind far too, far too many American Indians, Alaska Natives, and other minority and low-income youth. I want to know what you here at this conference think about those factors behind these persistent gaps and how we can eliminate them. My own thinking on, on education policy has primarily focused on how our K through 12 education system prepares or fails to prepare young people for college. And I know you will be discussing that today too. I hold three strong views about the American K through 12 system. First, notwithstanding the good education that many American youths receive, the persistent racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic achievement gaps are flat out unacceptable. Second, because these gaps are unacceptable, we must act boldly and decisively to eliminate them. And I mean eliminate them, not chip away at them. My own judgment, based on evidence to date, is that a combination of greater choice and greater accountability is critical to eliminating these gaps. As I argued in a speech at the Federal Reserve System's Strong Foundations Conference last March. But I have an open mind consistent with my third strongly held view 
that we need to devote more resources to detailed, hard-headed research on what really works in K-12 education. Let me close by illustrating some of what I find unacceptable today and discussing what we here at the Minneapolis Fed are going to, going to try to do about it. Here is a chart based on a decade of data from the Kids Count website on the, of the on-time graduation rates for Minnesota and Wisconsin high school students from three racial groups. Near the top of the chart, in the dotted orange line, you see that over 90% of non-Hispanic white students graduate on time in Wisconsin. The comparable rate in Minnesota showed by the solid orange line is only slightly lower. The green lines, the green lines show that the graduation rates for African Americans are much lower in both states, typically between 60 and 70%. This is already unacceptable and in need of research and evidence-based action. But look at the rates for American Indians shown in the black lines. Wisconsin's American Indian graduation rates are also unacceptably lower than for non-Hispanic whites. In Minnesota, however, they are not only far lower than for whites, but also far lower than for American Indians in Wisconsin or African Americans in either state. The enormous gap in graduation rates between American Indians and non-Hispanic whites in Minnesota is absolutely unacceptable. The corresponding gap in Wisconsin is much smaller, and we cannot explain that away by saying that Wisconsin's graduation standards are systematically different, given that the outcomes for whites and African Americans do not diverge much between the two states. An alternative explanation that the data themselves are just of poor quality and cannot be trusted is also unacceptable. We simply must have accurate measures of essential outcomes like high school graduation rates. In short, something up here, a lot up here, is simply not okay, and something needs to be done. The Minneapolis Fed will not ignore these issues. Our approach will be to determine the causes of unacceptable gaps and then propose evidence-based solutions. To that end, we founded the Center for Indian Country Development, your conference organizer, in 2015. This year, we launched the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. The mission of that institute is to conduct and promote research that will increase economic opportunity and inclusive growth for all Americans and help the Federal Reserve achieve its maximum employment mandate. The institute uses a multidisciplinary approach that includes the participation of leading academics from a variety of fields, including economics, education, law, public health, public policy, and sociology. It is guided by a world-class advisory board that helps us identify promising research topics and operates mainly by sponsoring research and dialogue. Specific components include a visiting scholar program. I see some of our visiting scholars here in the audience today a series of research conferences, and the publication of working papers. Detailed information about all of these, including our upcoming Octo October 26th conference on segregation and inequality, is on our website at minneapolisfed.org. If you are a scholar working on issues of economic opportunity and inclusive growth, we want you here with us. So please check out our website. I tell my staff here to think boldly and strive for big transformational improvements. In your conference today, I encourage you to do the same. Look at the higher education outcomes in your community. If you see evidence of big gaps, like those for the high school graduation rates in Minnesota, I hope you will see the need for decisive action and improvement. One thing I learned, Dick mentioned I worked at the Treasury Department during the financial crisis. One thing I learned in battling the 2008 financial crisis is that you cannot tackle a crisis with incremental measures. Tackling a crisis requires overwhelming force. So think boldly and in terms of not just reforming, but of transforming your education system. I believe an education system that fails large numbers of our youth is a crisis, and it demands a crisis response. This is urgent work. Your communities and our nation cannot afford to shortchange the current generation of American Indian and Alaska Native students, let alone future generations. I promise you that as you seek the solutions that we will work, that will work for you, my staff and I at the bank and at the Center for Indian Country Development will continue to support you through research, 
outreach, and convenings like this. I am excited to be here with you at this conference and look forward to working with you today and in the future. Thank you very much. So if uh, the first panel, Matt, I think, and Carmen can come up. Matt, you're first, right? Sure. I, have, I, sh I actually should check. Am I right? <laughs> Bonjour, Matthew McAmino, Anishit Kaz, Mishika Ndotam. My name is Matthew. I work at the American Indian College Fund. I'm the College Pathways Administrator. This is my lovely team. Um, for us older folks, they're not um, avatars. I was told they're bitmojis. So um, <laughs> you can see me. I'm the, the one up there hiding with my, my hands. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we work with should have asked how I'm using this. Just click it, right? To... Okay. So this is for advance. That's for back. This is your light. Okay. Thanks. So yeah. So um, the American Indian College Fund. Dave certainly gave you an overview uh, of what we do. So in our program, um, we do a lot of college access stuff. So we started last year uh, through a grant through the Mellon Foundation. Um, so really, we have four components. Oops. We'll go back. I'll let you look at that for a minute. But so we have four components that um, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit. But we're, we're really we're working with select high school students, tribal college transfer students, um, really helping them build a college-going environment. So I'm going to start out with this. Um, so I'm, I'm on the search. So if anybody in the audience has the college-going rate for Native students nationally, that'd be great. Um, so NCES uh, has one for everyone, which is roughly 69%. College-going rate being those students who graduate high school and enroll in college a two year or four year within one year. So I've slowly been trying to look and find some other states. Um, and so most of this data here, I, I do have sources, I didn't put them up there, but I pulled them from state education offices. So you can see uh, for South Dakota, again, they, they just put non white and non white. Um, in Wisconsin, I believe, uh, did I put that in there as well? Yeah. And so theirs is a little bit lower, but also that doesn't include tribal college enrollments, so that number might be a little bit higher than that. But you can see definitely a difference between 69 and roughly 40, 44 percent. It was a pretty big gap. Um, and so that's kind of part of the work that drives us in terms of helping students navigate that whole college choice process so that we can increase that number. So I was talking about we, we three components that we have in our Native Pathways program. So it's high school. So we work with um, we select a select four-year, two-year, or four-year TCUs, and we're working with their reservation-based area high school students. So we're working with 30 high schools right now. Uh, we get requests all the time to add, but we're a staff of five, so we're already outnumbered roughly in high school. I think our coaches are 244 to one, and our tribal college student, our transfer coordinator is like 277 to one in terms of students that we're working with. Um, so we have a high school component, and again, we're working with everything from financial literacy, FAFSA, uh, college applications, anything in there, um, we're working with them with that. Our transfer program, we're working with 12 TCUs. We're working with the two-year TCUs, helping the students, A, get their associates in terms of coaching, and then B, transfer to a four-year institution. <clears throat> and our bridge program, um, so we created a college readiness curriculum. Um, that we have available. So we did that our first year, we built that, and then we awarded four TCUs a grant to implement a year-round college readiness curriculum. Um, and that just started this summer, so that's going well, and we'll have probably more results of that next year. And then our fourth component that's not on there, we do have our first-year experience coach. So once we help the students get into college or transfer, that we have a coach there that they can still rely on in terms of when they get to their new institution, of helping them in that first year as well. 
Okay. Um, so in our program, we also do, um, and these are pictures from the different students that we're working with too. Uh, so we work with, we have a college campus visit grant. So we have individual grants for students or participants or up to $500 so that them and their family could go and, and take a campus visit. And then we also have group visits up to $6,000 that a tribal education director, um, a teacher, a counselor that can take a group of students on visits. Um, so this is a, a little bit on our first year. So they, we've had, we had some people from Wisconsin go to UCLA. Uh, we had people in Wisconsin just go to other Wisconsin schools. Um, so again, uh, all over. And here's a little bit on the individual visits. Um, again kind of take a look at some of the, and I, I didn't mention before, I'll mention at the end, but we are on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter. So expect to see 100 new followers out there. <laughs> so if you're on your phone, I expect you to be checking out our videos. <clears throat> OK, so we'll go to the next one. And then this is for the tribal college visits. And again, Fort Lewis was a popular destination for a lot of our students. Um, and again, I'm assuming a lot of that has to do with their tuition waiver. Um, so this is the type of ways that we interact with our students. Um, so we use Signalvine and text messaging is, is a really big uh, key. So we're able to interact with the students. Um, and this has been really, with our tribal college students, we had a lot of interaction. Uh, high school students, they get it, but they don't necessarily respond all the time. But the tribal college students, we were constantly getting information from them. And, and we found that they're, they're more likely to share with text messages than they are maybe over the phone or in person. Um, we're able to get things, you know, if somebody's having, if they think they have a learning disability and they might not know where to go. Um, we've had a student who I think we thought he was all set to go to college. And then we got a, a text and, and, it went, and he basically was saying, you know, here's all the stuff that's not happening. And, this isn't going right and I'm not gonna to go to college and how's that for a transfer story? And so we were able to, yeah, you know, they let you know. And uh, so our coach, you know, says, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, just give me a minute. And, and she was able to call the university and get everything fi fixed out and it was fixed in one day. And so, but you know, it's, you, that, that whole process, like one little thing can, can turn a student off. So it, it's been good to, have different avenues to connect with them and let them let them share. Um, again, social media messaging, we're really big on that. Again, as I was told by, uh, I have a much younger brother, but Facebook's for old people, he told me. Um, <clears throat> although I still think they're on there, they just don't post on there. So again, we, we tried to do a lot with Snapchat, we're still learning um, that process. And again, that's where the Bitmojis came in. Um, not so much in Twitter, we don't, we don't get a lot of interaction on Twitter, but definitely Instagram and then um, Facebook too. So in-person events, we try to get out there two to three times a year. And again, like I said, a lot of it's over uh, the phone or social media or um, Skype. Um, emails, they all have emails because right, they have to have emails with social media, but then when you talk to them, they're like, I don't know what my email is. So I think they have it to get on those devices and then they have no idea. Um, so our emails don't really go anywhere. Um, and again, campus visits and coffee meetups. Okay, so here's a little bit about our participants for the first year. This is for the first year. Um, so we had 765, and you can see there in terms of male, female, and chose not to answer. And this is for all high school and TCU. So here's our high school program, participants by school. Um, and you can kind of look through there. Uh, so we have, we're really good in terms of getting involvement with a lot of the South Dakota schools. Um, and then uh, just a little bit of mixture. And I haven't told you what states yet because I think I have a slide on there. And I'll, I'll wait and see. So I do. Cool. So these are the uh, high school regions. So these are the TCUs that we're working with. So the, this is the reservation area based high school students near these TCUs. We kind of selected high schools that we thought were feeder schools into these tribal colleges. Um, but again, once we started getting into the communities, other schools wanted in, and so we started adding schools as well. And we're starting to kind of stretch our barrier in terms of how far we go out. We've got a school that's probably like 15, 45 miles away from where we're at. Well, it wants in as well. But 
So there is a big need out there in terms of coaching and, and helping with that college choice. Let's see. And it was at college, it's cold. We went to visit in uh, <laughs> the dog days of summer, they said. It was like in, right there in early August, and it was 30 degrees and snowing. <laughs> and so, but they're, they're great people. They were, they're very welcoming. Um, so this is our by, for our first year. So this is by um, class. So most of the ones that we had in there were seniors. And then, and then you can see along the line. We do have 32 unknown. I'm working on my staff to get that so we, that we do know that. <laughs> um, so again, sometimes it was hard to read things in terms of when they fill out their application. And so we'll call the counselors and we'll get that fixed. Here's our participants for uh, TCUs. And again, you can see definitely the difference between male and female that we talked a little bit about yesterday. And again, these are uh, by colleges. So again, you can see the, the 12, I believe 12 colleges there. And you can look at the enrollment. And we're pretty good across the board there as well in terms of participation. Okay, so here's what I'll talk about today a little bit, is, is when we started and we had the students enroll, um, we have a, an initial survey that we have them fill out. And again, not everyone filled out. I guess I'm gonna have to go a lot faster. Uh, so you can see we had 183 responses um, for high school, 112 for TCU. And then I'll just kind of go through, I'll let you kind of read through some of this. Um, so again, this wasn't, okay. <laughs> I guess I don't have to rush, but I'll. Um, so we'll kind of go, I'll let you look through here. I won't read through all of them, but this is just kind of uh, the initial response. So we use this in terms of figuring out what students know or don't know so that we can try to target our work in terms of helping them and what we need to do. Um, and so in here, you can kind of take a look. Um, and again, between the two, certainly understanding what college admissions officers are looking for. Um, high school is a little bit stronger on that than tribal college. And again, I'm sure they're getting access to a lot of missions officers where a tribal co or transfer student may not be. So that might be somewhere we could focus too is it, when reaching out is connecting admissions officers to tribal college students. Um, and you can see they're all pretty, you know, they're, they're fairly confident in terms of their ability to succeed in, in college as well. Um, and again, another one up here that you know some people are surprised or not surprised by, but again, the, the family is supportive of higher education. Again, that's fairly high in terms of most people, of the students feeling that their family does support their, their desires to go to college. Um, and the same thing with maintaining cultural values while in college. Again, you can see again, um, and you, you may expect that certainly with a tribal college student, but then also high school, they're fairly confident they can do that as well. All right, so here's a big one again. So 32 and 24 in terms of being confident that higher education is affordable, right? And so that's a big one. And I don't know how many have been on a college admissions visit lately where they go in there and they tell you all how much it costs, right? Like here's the tuition, here's the housing, here's your snacks, here's everything else, and here's your $80,000 bill, right? And they're like, oh man, I can't do that. And so it automatically tunes them out without going over how to, how to overcome that and how to get um, support. So that, that's certainly a big one in terms of messaging and, and when working with students is thinking about they may not feel like higher education is affordable. And again, the other part, like we, we focus on the financing. Again, the, how to finance a budget. Um, I remember when I was in college, my sweet mate didn't know how to clean a bathroom. I don't know if he was making that up, so we had to clean it up, or didn't actually know. But um, so, uh, you know, again, going over some of the basics: what is a FAFSA? What is a credit card? Right? Do you really need that T-shirt and five credit cards? You know, so really trying to go over different basic budgeting and financing as well. Um, here's another one that we thought was really important too is again, you know, I guess someone mentioned it yesterday Everyone talks about if you're, you get good grades and you're native you should go to school for free And so what they're saying is they don't even know where to look for American Indian Alaska Native scholarships a lot of time Where are they? Where can I apply? Let, you know, let alone apply but where to find them and where to find these so we focus on that as well 
Um, and again, about 50%, about half, again, in terms of factors that succeed for American Indian students in college. What is it that will help them succeed? All right. Uh, and again, you know, right there, about there in the middle, roughly, again, half for where to find student support services. So if they're looking for Native organizations on campus, where to find those, who are the people they should be talking to is another important thing that we're trying to work on as well. Uh, they all seem pretty confident they know the different types of colleges out there. I'm not totally sure on that. Um, if we, we'll have to quiz them sometime on what's a liberal arts college or, or what that might be, but they seem pretty confident on that. Okay, here's where a few different ones. Uh, so the tribal college, again, with the transfer process, you can look up there um, in terms of articulation agreements and, and certainly course sequencing. A lot of times, sometimes a student may think they only have two more years once they get to the four-year school and then realize they have to take certain sequencing when they get there and then it turns into four years. So certainly we're trying to work on that and thinking about that process. Um, FAFSA, we do a lot of work with FAFSA, even though they had like 62% are comfortable. I'm not even comfortable filling out FAFSA, so imagine they're not either. Um, so we, we do a lot of that as well in terms of working with the school districts to try to do um, family nights to fill those out as well. So I went through those pretty quick. And so here's some just general reflections from our coaches and ourselves in terms of working. Um, certainly counselors, there's a lot of good counselors out there. There's a lot of counselors that are not out there. And then there's others who may not, who could do better. I think is, is what we say in our office a lot, you can do better. Um, in terms of, so it's, you know, we've had a situation where, where we went and we met with the principal and she was also the guidance counselor, so the guidance counselor quit. And she was also driving the bus for the morning kindergarten as well. So uh, we had another counselor, you know, that wasn't there when we first started and then they had one. And then the next year it was somebody different, right? And again, if you're trying to work with guidance counselors and there's a high turnover, it's hard to build that relationship and get that information. So we had a lot of that as well. Um, <clears throat> And certainly, like I talked about that one story with a transfer student, and again, you know, and even with a high school student. So anything that might be a small negative thing sometimes can be really for the student a major thing, right? We might think it's minor, but they, it may be major to them where they're just gonna, like, I'm done with it. So really a lot of reinforcing, reaching out and making sure to try to help overcome um, those obstacles, right? And so it might even be like just a couple phone calls and not getting a response. So really trying to work with students to build on that persistence and that um, assertiveness uh, as they get into college. So again, that was a quick overview. And I do have a longer one I, we did with our staff. I told them we had, we had 55 slides. And I was like, well, I couldn't get everything I wanted in 55 slides. We have a lot more I didn't share in here, but I tried to, am I good on time? Good. Very good on time. So again, there we are on our, you can catch us at Native College Pathways on Facebook and at Native Pathways on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And again, we do a lot of videos, so I, I encourage you to check them out. I and mean, we believe representation's important. Um, so while there are other organizations that might have similar stuff, we kind of do it with our coaches. Um, so what we, I think one of our most popular ones was on FAFSA and just had one of our coaches throwing money in the air. And again, um, we're not professional marketing team. We're just kind of doing it on our own um, to give us, and if you look from the beginning when our videos to now, it's, it's a huge, Huge improvement, um, but a lot of students like it. And so we did. We I think our latest that we did was on Vision Board, um, that was really popular as well in terms of helping students, uh, you know, create goals for themselves to reach. So, I don't know if I do a question or do we go? We'll do the question at the end. Okay. So Matt, uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks. Just for a second. Yeah. Um, so I want to, uh, I'm starting to feel a little bit, I woke up this morning not feeling very good, and I'm a little off my game. Uh, so I didn't really uh, properly introduce Matt, and uh, I'm going to let you do it one more time, so I really want to get the pronunciation right. What, say your name one more time for me. Macomina. Macomina. And uh, Matt is, uh, I should have said, at least even though you got the speaker bios, Matt is with the American Indian College Fund. So thank you very much, yep. Matt, Thanks. and he'll be back for Q&A after our next presentation, which is by Carmen Lopez from College Horizons. Thank you. Okay. 
Actually, I don't need this one on, right? Since I'm, I've got this. Right. Chikedo Shedene, uh Carmen Lopez Yunisha, Dwodich Ni Ninchle, Ado Bilagana Dasha Bashishin, Klizathana Klizathana Dachiche, Ado Bilagana Dachinella, uh Black Mesa, Arizona, Ado Cayenta, Arizona, Ado Farmington, New Mexico, Ado Rio Rancho New, New Mexico, De Nasha. Um, it's a pleasure to greet you this morning, and um, it, it's, it's wonderful to come to this um, conference uh, looking at higher education, and as I think for, for many of you um, in our discussion yesterday, um, I think one of the important things is, is we have to think about K through 12 within higher ed. The whole cradle to career is the continuum that we need to think about. I know there was an early childhood ed conference last year and now we're focusing on higher ed and, and there's the projections for next year. But when we silo this, um, that's part of the problem. So I'd encourage the thinking to, to go beyond because I could talk about college access from prenatal care and that college begins in the womb with uh, prenatal care, with reading to our children. So, and reading um, is the best predictor of test scores in ACT and SAT. So um, I'm, I'm gonna weave some of those things in from yesterday um, as, I, as I present on um, a little bit of the work of College Horizons. Um, and Dick, I had those handouts if you wanna, if you wouldn't mind passing out um, a couple of things. There, uh, one sheet that's coming around is an infographic on the demographics of the native students that we served in this last summer um, that was hosted by Princeton University and Whitman College. So that, that's gonna go around um, showing um, the, the types of students that we service from around uh, the nation. We service American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian students from across the nation. So we're a national college access program. Um, there's a flyer, I thought I had brought um, um, all of my scholars program flyers and this one on the back is the, the back side is what I want you to take away and, and read. Although I don't think there's as many, um, my other program College Horizons which I'll show is in the mix there but uh, if you don't get them I'll make them available to Dick to send to you as a PDF as well. Uh, just because the scholars program is really getting into some important new work that we're engaging in. But in general, just to give the background, we're a national organization. We started off, the founder of College Horizons, Dr. Whitney Laughlin, uh, is a non-native woman who uh, worked in Hawaii, who worked in the Southwest, um, and I met her at the Native American Preparatory School. That was my first teaching position out of, um, out of college. And she created the College Horizons program in the Southwest in New Mexico with the basic premise that she was working with talented, bright uh, Native students who were having trouble accessing higher ed simply from the process and particularly from the financial aid process. So she said, if they're able, if they're bright, they wanna go, then we should be making it easier for them to, to get to uh, college. And the NAPS campus was in a really remote part of um, northern New Mexico. And so if colleges came to visit, it was several hours for them to get there. So when they would come to campus, she would keep them there, there for several hours and said, well, why don't you sit down and, and work with them on their college application, on their essays, or on financial aid. So this is how she started to attract the colleges to become partners of uh, the organization. We're in our uh, 19th year, we're about to celebrate our 20th year uh, coming up this coming year. So far we've served about 3,000 students um, and about 800 college admission officers, high school counselors, and tribal educators. Each summer we have a cohort of about 200 to 300 students. I'm starting my scaling up. We're gonna get up to about 400 um, in two years. Um, um, and generally, this is for the overall, overall cohort, about 60% uh, are first generation to college, about 55, 
60% are Pell eligible and 60% reside on homelands or within 60 miles of, of homelands. Um, in each cohort, there's a big diversity in terms of high schools represented. So there's about 130 different high schools. Um, so we have a broad reach nationally with, with students. And in fact, just on um, Monday when I arrived, I was able to meet with some of our students from Minneapolis that came to our program um, last year. Um, generally, there's about 60 tribal nations represented. Overall, we're putting together a big report of the 3,000 students. We've serviced almost 250 tribal nations in our 20-year our history, and about uh, 700 different colleges are represented by our overall 3,000 cohort, and that includes some of uh, the tribal colleges as well. And then today, I currently have about um, 75 uh, college partnerships. And then at each program, um, or each summer, I'm working with about 120 admission um, counselors and 60 high school and tribal counselors that come to the program for professional development. So here's what we do. These are the three programs. Um, as I said, Whitney started off with College Horizons. That's the college access. And then she built out the Graduate Horizons program. So that was for Native students on how to um, navigate the admission process for graduate schools or professional schools. And in between, the Scholars program was missing. That's brand new. We just launched that last year. Um, as well. So I wanted to build out the continuum. We're working with high school students all the way up to graduate. And what are we doing in between with the retention side of our, our work and our alumni? So this is now fully um, starting to form. It's taken me years to get that scholars program running because of funding. Um, so um, I'm real excited and I'm going to be talking about what the scholars program is. Very quickly, on the College Horizon, so as I came in, um, the, this is the pre-college one week working with high school students. Um, we're doing the entire application process, running them through every single part of the application so that they come to their senior fall with a really great draft of getting ready to apply to college that fall, including building out their college lists. FAFSA, my parents are required to submit taxes. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, and that's, that's one of the, thing, the barriers that I think in terms of families and family structures that we see a lot in at College Horizons that the FAFSA isn't being completed because the taxes are not complete yet. And then with family structures, sometimes the child is not living with that biological parent. They might be with an aunt, a grandparent, an older sibling is providing the primary financial, parents might not be in the picture. So you have to know how to navigate that FAFSA and also how to work with financial aid offices for students in those uh, situations. Important to me is um, at College Horizons, I'm planting the seeds of nation building. So this is where we are starting to talk about um, what does it mean to identify um, as indigenous. Students um, in College Horizons have to be an enrolled um, uh, citizen of their nation, either federal or state. We do take some students that are descendants, and then that requires the documentation from um, from the tribal enrollment office for that as well. But this is where we start to say, on the college application process, all of a sudden you're checking some boxes. Well, what does that actually mean? Um, not only to you as a person, but also in terms of ethnic fraud. This is the place where many people will check the box on the college admission application process for the first time in their lives because someone has coached them that diversity, ancestry, heritage is something that you need um, to be competitive in the admission process. And this is where we start to talk about sovereignty and citizenship. Um, and the role of education in our ancestors having given up land um, uh, for us to have this higher education. So it's important to start to have students think about what is education mean to them, not only from an individual capacity development point of view, but also from a tribal capacity development. What are you gonna potentially contribute to your nation um, as, a, as a citizen? The Scholars Program then is our first year bridge. It's a three week program. Um, we do academic preparations, social emotional learning, which is a big thing. I'm gonna talk a lot about that. 
um, today. And it's also about physical well-being and identity development as well. Uh, we will provide wraparound services, so they just spent three weeks um, at Lawrence University in, in Appleton, Wisconsin, and so now we're following those students and their parents, so we're providing um, support to parents um, of our students in the scholars program because they need as much help navigating and supporting their students as they go off to college. Um, and this is where we are using a decolonizing and well-being model. In our world of college access, we're measured by college graduation completion rates. So I can tout that at College Horizons, we have an 85% college completion rate within five to, six, five to six years. So that's pretty significant when you compare that to the data that was presented yesterday. Um, but it's more than academics. Um, to me, I'm trying to shift the conversation that Native student success isn't just about that degree. Uh, if we're graduating students that are broken, um, that are disillusioned by higher education, that are burnt out, is that, is that what we're after with this? I'm interested in graduating students that are whole people, um, the well-being and health of them mentally, spiritually, physically, academically, so that they can go into um, Indian country a whole person um, and not having to detox from higher education for, for a year or six months. Um, so this is a really important um, way a shifting and this is where I'm trying to get funders to think about that that it's not just the 85 percent that I'm trying to 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 show you that that Native students can complete the degree but we've got to be graduating them in a certain way as well the last part is the graduate horizons now and that's a three-day um, intensive on how to help college students or college graduates on applying to masters or doctoral or professional schools. And this is where I see the nation builders. This is really exciting when I work with, um, with, with students in, in the Graduate Horizons program because they are on the cusp. It's like, just give them this skill set and let's see what they're gonna get, do in the next five years um, within their, their nations. So um, the factors affecting college entry and completion. I pulled out some of the things that I think are structural. Um, so the, all of College Horizons focuses our energy on the development of the students. It's technical direct assistance to the students on the application process. But I'm also interested in the structural inequities that are in place that we've also got to attack alongside the work that we're doing with the students. So for me, I'm gonna talk about the counseling side. 80% of um, admission officers are white, all right? So we're talking about the college admission side, the gatekeepers to our students coming in. It's a profession that is dominated um, by, by uh, white folks, as well as on the high school side of things, it's 90% are non-native counselors, all right? So we've got that shortage. Someone else talked about that with the teachers. Um, there's no required coursework on college counseling for our high school counselors, okay? There's no required coursework in graduate programs for college counseling. This is a big problem. NACAC um, and NCAN, some of the professional organizations on college access are addressing this uh, right now, but this is the thing we train high school counselors in um, you know, uh, behavior development, adolescent development, um, academic advising, but there's nothing on how to be an effective college counselor and how to create a college-going culture within your school. There is a correlation between counselor training and their ongoing training and student outcomes. So the better trained someone is in high school college counseling, the better their outcomes are gonna be at that high school of students going on to college, all right? So that's a study that's been done. Um, the other part, the other stat came from, I think the NAEP. Uh, this is 60% of eighth graders, this is native students, 60% of native eighth graders have not discussed with their counselors their high school course load. 
right? So when I look at college access, I'd love to create a College Horizons program that starts with ninth and 10th graders. I wanna work with them earlier on, and the earlier advising is all about the course planning. Because when you go to the colleges, and I'm not sure here, I should have looked up in the state of Minnesota what the minimum requirements are for applying to your state institutions. So that should always be the minimum in terms of your courses. If we want to attack the STEM problem, it's math. It's high school math. So are our students on track in high school with their math in order to apply? Some of our colleges require foreign language. Some of our colleges require four years math and science. So our, do our counselors know that um, if they don't advise their students on certain coursework, they could actually be ineligible to apply to certain colleges. So this is really critical with the coursework and the sequencing, also for um, test preparation as well. Um, so shifting from the counseling side, both on the admission or the high school side, and then now to the admission officers, um, our work, because I partner with college admission officers, they come to the program and they're providing um, the advising. So right, I've got the people evaluating the college application um, expertise there in the room with the students to help them understand what the process looks like and how to um, adjust the applications. Um, there is an incredible lack of understanding of the indigenous student context. So, Colleges send their admission officers to my program for professional development to understand what does it mean to work with uh, native students from across the country? What are the disparities, the inequities that they have to, that our students um, live and experience, and how does that translate into the inequities in the college admission process? That's what I drive home. Um, the deficits that we might say our students have, what I say to our college admission officers is where you see deficits, I see the legacy of genocide and colonization and assimilation and the structural racism and structural inequalities that exist in our communities. It's so important for admission officers to understand um, what type of technology is available out there for Native students? Um, are their schools wired well? Uh, do they have internet in the home, quality internet to fill out those college applications? Uh, do they have ACT and SAT test centers um, right in the, the schools or the student having to travel far away for that? These are important things for colleges to understand the context of Indian country. There is, there's some solutions that we have for this too. Um, around the context side, I think all tribal education departments should create their own school profile, community profile summary. So when a student applies to a college, the counselor submits a recommendation and they can insert a school profile. This is critical for college admission officers to understand the employment rates um, around the community, the health and social well-being around the community, um, and what type of um, um, academic uh, opportunities are available to the students. They're relying on that counselor to provide the context of that student um, and the parents. And if our schools are not providing that context, then I think that the tribal ed departments could. And that could be something that um, is standardized. Every tribal ed department has it on their website or every tribal ed requires that the school counselor submit the tribal profile alongside the school counselor profile. That would be an amazing thing for tribes to negotiate with the schools. Um, in addition to that, of course, is implicit bias in the college admission process, uh, deficit thinking and evaluation. And then um, the, another big thing, um, as some, some of the discussions that we had, I always do a training for um, the admission counselors at the program on understanding race, ethnicity, and tribal citizenship in admissions. So what does this mean when a student checks the box on the common application, the, the, your state um, applications, the new coalition application? Um, what does this mean? And how do they understand this? Because they want to take away, you know,
you know, they want to take the step back at, we can't talk about race and admissions, you know, this is, uh, there's certain states that don't allow this. Well, you can talk about citizenship and the political status of, of native peoples. That is not a race-based discussion. And you should be thinking about native students like international students. And when they shift to the international side, then they start to have a better understanding of what, um, how do you understand a, a, a native student in America? It's like an international student. So think about it that way, think about it differently. The two, uh, two other things I wanna talk about in terms of factors affecting college entry and completion is uh, the academic side, this rigor and testing. Um, what opportunities, so these are the structural pieces that need to be addressed for our students. Opportunities for AP honors and dual courses in our communities. What does that look like for your students? Um, AP is costly to schools too. And we have to be careful. Um, um, you know, I have partnerships sometimes with the college board, sometimes with ACT. So I'm not a person that can be bought out by the testing companies. And they're trying to do their, their, their due diligence in serving underrepresented students. But we also have got to hold the testing companies accountable because they're part of the barriers for native students in college. So we need to be critical about this. I, I talk with several principals in New Mexico about AP because um, College Board can come in and, and so does um, uh, ACT, uh, can come into states, right, and offer up millions of dollars to offer this type of testing. So now we have states that are ACT or SAT. Um, and, but the AP costs, there's hidden costs around that, especially in, in our, our schools. You're taking the best teachers, potentially at a school, who is teaching a, um, maybe a course of 30 students, and when they take, become an AP teacher, that course shrinks down to maybe 15. Now, what happens to those other students that that teacher was supporting um, as one of their best teachers? Now, you've got um, fewer students that are taking that class. Um, and there's not a lot of results right now on um, AP test scores and um, credit for Native students. I keep asking for some of this data and in reports. And um, I worry that students are taking an AP course but are also not getting any credit for that when they go off to college. And that's supposed to be the equalizer that's out there. And it's not happening, um, I think, for, for Native students the way it's supposed to be. Um, there's limited test preparation, there's testing deserts. So um, I'm, I'm hopefully gonna be working with Dr. Chris Nelson to do this testing desert study to, to map out what does the testing sites look like within Indian country, how far soon. So this is data that we collect um, ourselves internally and now I wanna see what does this look like for our students. Um, and here is the biggest thing. ACT and SAT tests should be offered on a Monday through Friday. They should not be, especially in rural communities, they should not be offered on a Saturday when there are no buses that run and when the students have activities or family obligations. It should be a school-based test Monday through Friday so that every student has access to it. So some of the testing sites have started to do this, but this is something in Indian country that we could push on for the ACT and SAT. It should be offered during the weekday so that every student has access to that test. Um, and then uh, there's the myth of technology as an equalizer for test preparation. So I'm gonna pick on Khan, uh, Khan Academy. Um, the best use of Khan Academy, the studies are showing for underrepresented students, is that um, it has to be school-based, at the school, certain time allotted, consistent time uh, during the school day. That's the best preparation that Khan Academy is showing for underrepresented students right now. When we think that we create a test prep free uh, platform for students to use in their off hours, again, how are they accessing it? Is it on their phone? Um, what is the data plan that's available? At what time are they able to use that free resource? Um, the best test preparation is still um, the structured environment, certain time um, over a certain amount of period. So I just don't think that by offering it up to say that you know there's a free resource for you to use, figure it out on your own, it's, it's not servicing our, our students well. Um, 
the last thing, bias of test score over context and, and rigor. So this is a huge thing that I try uh, to work with our um, admission reps on. Um, we collect test information of our students as they're coming into the program. And it's not the final test that they might be taken because we're working with them as the rising seniors and rising juniors. So the likelihood is that they're gonna take the exam one more time. Um, and um, this is where I wanna prove through College Horizons students, uh, about 35% of our students are admitted and graduate from um, highly selective institutions. And what I wanna show is the range of test scores that those students are, are testing at in combination with their um, grades and the rigor of the courses in high school and college completion. So. There's debates right now, just came from NACAC again, where um, you know, there are schools that are test optional. I, I highly recommend test, test optional schools for native students. And what, what the testing companies are trying to disprove is the correlation between first year progress as a student and transcript, not testing score. It's the transcript and first year performance as a college student. Uh, and there, there's the conversations about shifting that. So we have to be really careful about the testing industry and native students. Um, and we've got to really be pushing back and having critical conversations about that. The last thing we need to think about in this room is scholarships uh, that require tests, and especially for uh, tribal nations or native um, organizations that have as a requirement a test score. Now, I like the ones that have um, a combination of a GPA and a test, so it's a scale. Um, because are we contributing to the barrier of our own students qualifying for our own financial aid based upon the flaws of all these tests? So how can we be using a tool that um, isn't designed for native students and maybe doesn't measure their, um, their, uh, their testing abilities well? Jay Rosner, who um, was formerly with the Princeton Review Foundation, he always stresses that um, what the test measure, ACT and SAT measures, is your ability to take a test well. It does not measure in intellect. We think it does, but it does not measure your intelligence. It measures how well you know how to take that test, okay? So we have to be careful if we're gonna be buying into a testing requirement and the costs associated with that test as well um, as, as funders. Um, last part, again, taxes, FAFSA completion, and financial aid uh, gapping is especially. These are the main things that we see working with our students and parents um, around uh, financial aid. So uh, Whitney Laughlin, um, her initial partnerships with colleges was uh, based on a financial aid criteria. She only allowed colleges to participate with College Horizons who were able to meet the full demonstrated need of a, of a student that got admitted there. So even on our uh, one of the flyers, you'll see on the back side all of these liberal arts um, selective institutions. Um, these guys have a lot of financial aid, and they're able to do um, full need-based aid. Whereas some of our um, uh, state institutions and, and a lot of the institutions that Native students are attending um, are restricted with their funding. So states are in a crunch right now. They have been for several years and there's incredible amount of gapping. So I have students with zero EFCs who are being gapped by five, 10, 15,000 at our state institutions sometimes. That's significant. Um, so this is an important conversation to be having at our state level where our students are, how, many, how much of our native students are being gapped um, by the institutions. Um, with parents, a huge part is getting the taxes up to date. So as part of our application process, we require taxes to be submitted. And I get a lot of upset calls by parents saying like, why, why do you need this information? What does this have to do with anything? And um, so I've got to walk them through to say, 
Um, where are you at with your taxes? Okay, you're a year behind, a couple of years behind, or um, you know, I'm not the one that claims them on my taxes. Well, it's not about who claims the child as a dependent. It's who's the who for 51 percent of the time does that that student stay with. There's a lot of advising around taxes and FAFSA completion that needs to be done with Native families. And it starts here. In order to access the aid, the taxes have to be completed. So I'd love to do a big H&R block um, collaboration where we have a FAFSA completion night in Indian country. That's the way to move the FAFSA needle over is those types of collaboration. Maybe, maybe the Federal Reserve Bank has an entity that they could work with to get taxes done for Native people. Um, let me see. The last, let me just see. All right, last slide. I have to wrap up here. Um, here's the last part that's so important. Um, the, the question that I'm starting to develop with, um, with Shelly Lowe here from, from HUNAP is what are the barriers to college beyond the application process? What does racial equity and healing look like in the college access and success space? So one of the key things is um, around racial equity and with working with Native students is in the college application process, you're telling your story. Um, we're, we're, con we're pulling from the student, what is my story that I have to tell that would be interesting for a college to consider? And in that story, we are unpacking a lot of trauma and hurt um, that our students are experiencing. Um, and again, I'm unraveling to say, you're not broken, your parents are not broken, your communities are not broken. There have been structures in place for 500 years and policies designed to create what you are going through. And for a child to finally have someone, it's, it's just like men of color who are being followed and you have this feeling that the system is working against you. The system is working against you. And it's the acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement of that to, to young people to, ex to say, yes, what you and your family is experiencing, you're not making it up. Um, and to work with a 16-year-old who feels this, I mean, they, they know it. They just don't have the words to talk about structural racism and microaggressions and racial battle fatigue. They don't have those words yet, but they live it and they know that something is going on. This is where we are starting to have this conversation in the scholars program. They're ready to talk about race and inequality in K through 12. And I think uh, the, the DAPL movement last year really brought out this in a new way for young people to be able to discuss this. Um, and the last two points on, on here, or the last three points, um, in our scholars program, um, we're introducing these uh, theories of decolonizations, equipping students with an intellectual framework before they go into college. So we're about to hit Halloween. We're gonna go into Thanksgiving time on our college campuses. This is when all the crazy Halloween parties are gonna take place. The football games with native, native mascotry is all taking place, the NFL right now. This comes at Native students in college and it blasts at them. We need to prepare them before they go off to colleges. So I'm a Dartmouth alum, so I can talk about this. I need to let them know about that um, mascot at Dartmouth so that when they see um, young frat boys walking around wearing the Indian symbol, that they know how to approach that conversation, that they can have that anger and say, that's totally wrong, that's racist. It's not political correctness, it is racist. Um, we need to be able to help our students to understand how to talk about this um, in an intellectual and academic space, um, in addition to a personal space, because they're hurting from this. Um, and then the last parts on here, I won't go into, I'll wait till um, maybe the wrap up. Um, but attending a predominantly white in institution, imposter syndrome, fitting in, finding and creating uh, community and relevance of coursework is a huge part of what we need to work with our students on in terms of retention uh, for college. And we're gonna introduce it to our students as high school, high school students. Uh, we think that they're ready for this work um, and that they'll be prepared um, with some um, prayers and protection way uh, as they go into college. Thank you.
Sure. So Matt's coming back up. We'll keep the questions here a little short because we're running a little bit late. We'll try to get to the break on time, but keep your, we'll have a few now and then remember that we'll have our uh, moderated discussion too at the end of the morning. Um, so are there, someone like to start now? Yes, we've got one in the back. Yes, I'm Catherine Campbell. I'm program analyst at the Bureau of Indian Education, and I work with the post-secondary, our 29 BIE-funded tribal colleges and universities. And I'm finding that this discussion is bringing those, those uh, strings together. When I hear about different things that people are doing, I know I was in the director's office at one time when I think it was Diane Humatiwa came to us and she was at ASU and she said that um, our schools were not preparing um, the students to go into a school like ASU. Uh, and we have uh, four off-reservation boarding schools that are high schools. And that kind of stuck with me. And even when I was um, doing my research, my question was how do, children, how do Indian children succeed in school and what factors contribute to that success of them? So being in the K-12, I would look at our kids and see how they would struggle and um, go to school and they'd be funded and they'd turn around and come back. And they didn't even know that they were in remedial courses that never mm -hmm. would get them any credit. So when I came into the tribal college realm and was going out and doing site visits. I've done 27 so far of the 29. And listening to students there, what I'm hearing is that they are saying they like the one-on-one -on -one of the colleges. And they are building that confidence. And they are able to go further if they need to once they have that confidence. And what I think we are looking at in the director's office is looking at a K-16 model with our BIE funded schools and our BIE funded tribal colleges and looking that at how we will prepare them, but starting early like some of your programs are doing in our K K-12 schools and having that discussion with our tribal college staff and our high school staff on how they can up that academic rigor, how they can have that discussion about going to college where you see a lot of these kids and I'm looking at every file in some of these colleges and seeing where these kids are at and how, the, how well they're doing or where they came from, whether they got a GED or they graduated and I will see, and I was a high school principal and I saw those kids, the, how they would struggle and, and if they went off and they came back, they weren't able to make it because they didn't have that support. But if we are having that discussion and I'm not only saying, because you know we talk about silos and that's happening, even when you have a, a community that, have a tri that has a tribal college, you have um, silos operating there because you, ha you don't have the tribe engaged in that conversation. You have the tribal college doing their thing. You may have the K-12 doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to come to that table and have that conversation because those st students that are the end result are gonna affect the tribe in the end. So we have to have that conversation about what, what we are doing in our schools and we have to have it together. And I think that we are able, as the BIE, to start looking at that because we have focused a long time on K-12, but we haven't really looked at our tribal colleges. And our tribal colleges are a viable option for our students because it provides them with uh, language and culture that they will build that confidence. And you have to have that confidence to go out into the mainstream. And I think that uh, is one point that starts that so I'm excited about this and I'm looking also not only just at the tribal colleges but how BIE can build partnerships with mainstream universities because we need good teachers in our K-12 system mm -hmm. and we you know we are you know failing these students if we don't look at that and we don't address it soon so I think if we look at one way of how we can have that conversation and look at our K-16 model even in local communities that we have, I think we're gonna see a change. Thank you. Here you are, yes. 
Lisa, Lisa Cook. I am a professor of economics at Michigan State University. I'm here visiting mm -hmm. at the Growth and Opportunity Institute. And I am the director of the American Economic Association summer program that encourages underrepresented minorities in economics to uh, do PhDs in economics. And the last role is the one that I appreciate your, uh, your presentations for. Thank you so much for your presentations. I think, Maria, um, I'm sorry, Carmen, one of the um, points that you made was incredibly important, that you're preparing nation builders. There are so few economists who are Native Americans. And I think that this is part of, part of this pipeline that we're creating should include economics. And I think that the center is focused on economic development. That's my, my sense of it. I'm getting to know it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here to listen. But I think that we, if, if I could partner with both of you in trying to figure out how this could be better done, that would be fantastic, number one. Number two, I'd like to connect you to the Algebra Project if you're not already mm. wor working with the Algebra mm. Project. This is a, um, a nonprofit that addresses in the seventh grade algebra, recognizing mm -hmm. that underrepresented minorities get tracked out of math starting at about that time mm. so that they can't get into college, right? So uh, yes, this starts very early. Mm -hmm. And as a person who used to teach math and test prep in high school, I certainly saw this happening all the time. But they're a national organization, and I think that they would be willing to show up at uh, a number of the places where you all partner. Uh, finally, thank you for the comment about test prep. I used to teach test prep. One of the things that I don't do in my uh, courses at Michigan State is to give multiple choice exams, for example it only tests how you can take multiple choice exams. Mm -hmm. So I always write the exam questions so everybody learns how to really answer questions. And I got paid a lot of money to teach test prep. Mm -hmm. These are tips and tricks. Mm -hmm. And this is not going to get you, say, uh, you know, I'm worried at the dissertation stage. If you know how to take a really good SAT, GRE, that will only get you so far. It will not get you through a dissertation. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about it from that uh, from that angle, so I really appreciate you uh, focusing on this very early on. Mm. Good morning, my name is Henry Fernandez with Complete College America. Mm -hmm. My question is to both of you with just short, brief answers. Um, if you were in a room where the audience was um, filled uh, with education policy makers or system heads or uh, tribal college leaders, what are the one, two, or three scalable solutions that you would recommend for their higher education systems? Based on the knowledge that you have, the, the, the success of your program, Carmen, and, and the tribal college students that are, um, that. Matthew deals with, what are the one, two, or three recommendations, structural recommendations that are scalable that you would um, suggest to these leaders? Okay. Um, number one and number two are the same, um, so I get two more answers. <laughs> um, the, the federal government has got to fund Native nations at the level that they are supposed to be funded. And that's health care, that is education, that's the tribal colleges. So we, we operate with so little dollars when our treaty rights and our sovereign rights have mandated it. So, so that's the number one. We're talking about inequity. Um, and whether it's going to be new Supreme Court cases that need to be ushered in right now under this current administration, but we've been underfunded for, you know, 200 years. So there's got to be parity um, with that, number one. So, so that's addressing some of the funding inequities. Um, and that's at the state level, too. So uh, a person talked about the, um, the Rainy Day Fund in Montana. New Mexico has the same thing. We've got billions of dollars sitting there, and we're 49th in the state um, for education. When, when, when 
when is how, how how much more worse does it have to get to tap into that so that that's the funding at the state and federal levels for k through 12 and for our tribal colleges i would say first um first and foremost that's that's um equity requires effort and equity requires the resources that need to be in place and i would say the second thing is respecting tribal um sovereignty and self-determination we have the solutions for what we need to be what needs to be done um and if i have the ability to in you know create a college horizons at every native school across the country i would i would gladly do it but i need the resources and infrastructure to do it and i think that's the main thing on the scaling side so i i really i hate the word scaling um, uh, it's difficult in foundation pressure. So that's a pressure to me. How do you scale? How do you take the wonderful work you're doing at College Horizons and scale it up? It takes one on one time with these students. It is an intensive intervention. I need time to work with these students. It's not all going to be done on online applications and using technology to, to, to move us forward. Technology will get us to a certain place to get the, um, the technical aspects done, but I need to unpack um, racism and um, colonization and genocide with our students. So that takes time. Um, and, if, and if people, Foundations, policymakers cannot understand that human one on one interaction. Um, I, I don't, it, you, then it's because you're asking me the wrong question. My value systems are different. When I'm going to be an auntie to my kids at College Horizons, that auntie love is tough, but it's also a lasting one because it's relationship. Um, so, how do I, how do, how do I convince you that it's about my relationships that matter the most over scaling? One or two. Um, you know, I th think the first, you know, there was a phrase I see a lot of times where, like, where the people say, I see you, right? I see you. And I think with Native people often, especially in big data, right, we, we don't see Native people. We don't see American Indians. They're not statistically significant enough. There's not enough population. One percent of our student population in our college is not enough to matter in terms of, of in making that investment. So I think it's important to see Native students that they're out there, um, to also recognize that they're not just on reservations, but they're also in urban areas. I've worked at institutions where they always wanted me to go out into the reservations, and I'm looking like five miles down the road, and I'm like, we got a ton right here as well that we're not even working with. So thinking about that as well um, is important. And, and often when I work with students, I, I, when we get them, a lot of times they'll come down during the lunch hour, and so we're, I'm, we, we, we encourage students to go to, because I do believe there's a college for everyone, right? And we, we, we'll help them go to beauty school. We'll help them go to Dartmouth. You know, we'll, in between, we, we, we just help them with their future, and we help them. So a lot of times when I talk with students, it's the first time sometimes you can see it in their eyes when it's the first time someone's even mentioned the possibility of going to education or higher education. And they might not go right away. Maybe they go later, but you can tell when they're saying, you can do this, and I'm going to help you. Um, so I think that's the other part too is talking is getting people in those places who not are just good teachers or good recruiters or good whatever it might be, but personally care about helping Native students or any, all students, right? Um, sometimes people in their jobs get caught up and there's all these things they don't like and they, they lost, um, Sam old school, what was that top gun, that love and feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to love what you're doing. You got to love and be passionate about helping students and that's what I do in my job, and it's it, it's a blessing and a curse sometimes because it consumes me all the time. Even when I'm with my kids, I'm thinking about different things or reading things um, because I want to help students, and it matters to me. So I think the more you get people that matters to them, the better that will be as well. Thank you so much. I think we'll take a break now. Let's give our um, presenters a round of applause. It was terrific, absolutely terrific. 50.
So we're going to have now a very, an extended discussion of a kind of case study. Uh, this will fit in, I think, with some of the themes that came up in the previous session. Carmen warned us against siloing uh, the different components of education from early childhood, K-12, college, even beyond. Um, and if I have to think of some people who've, whom I've seen present on education issues in Indian country who are not taking a siloed issue, siloed approach, who are taking a, I don't you, you've got your whole uh, pipeline approach. What do you call that pipeline, Chris? Education pipeline. <laughs> education pipeline, <laughs> simple enough. Oh. And so the, Chris, oh. Dr. Chris Meyer is from the um, Department of Education, the Kirtland tribe. And she's joined by her colleague from the Department of Education, Shauna Daniels, here. We also have Barbara Aston from Washington State and Yolanda Bisbee from the University of Idaho. And they're going to be talking about the college, primarily, not exclusively maybe, but primarily the college portion of that pipeline. But I want you to know that they do not think in silos. They are very articulate about having a pipeline from the very early stages all the way through. And you're going to hear about the college part of that pipeline. Uh, we're running a couple minutes late, but I think we'll make up, uh, we'll do fine here. Uh, and uh, give them time to go tell us all about uh, how they've worked together, the tribe and the two universities, uh, to address some of the issues we heard about this morning. So uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dick, for that introduction. My name is Chris Meyer, and I am an enrolled member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, and I'm the director of education for our tribe. What you see here is um, our original homeland, and you can see that it extends into Washington State, Montana, and, um, and you can see where we are at today. Um, our office is located in Plummer, Idaho. Washington State University is um, about 60 miles south of our community and the University of Idaho is approximately 40 miles from our reservation. What you see here is our uh, Department of Ed uh, organization chart. My department is responsible for education, birth through professional degrees. The tribe has four major entities. We have the casino resort, we have tribal government, we have the development corporation, and we have the um, Benoit Medical Center. My department is under tribal government and there are 20 programs and so we are one of 20 programs that operate under the tribal government. This slide shows a picture of an event that happened in 1972. The sisters the nuns were operating our day school at that time, and they met with the tribal leadership and let them know that they were no longer going to be able to provide education to our youth. And so they met with the bishop and the BIA at that time, and because the tribe wanted to continue to provide education to our tribal membership, the tribal school was established. Again, this was in 1972. This was the beginning of the tribe beginning to govern education. The BIA had control of that school for many, many years. Also at this period of time, the tribe had a Head Start program 
and they also had a higher education uh, program as well. Again, at this time, the BIA still had ultimate control over the decisions that we, we were making over education. This is 2006. I became the director of education in 2006. And I remember when the tribe hired me, the tribal council kept coming up to me and saying, please take education up another notch. And um, what they didn't know is that before I considered taking the position, I did not know how I was going to be able to do that. How was I going to be able to look at education birth through PhDs? So in 2007, the pipeline was designed. And so what you see above the pipeline, and this is 2016. So those are the students that are on um, this trajectory. So again, I'm responsible for birth through PhDs. And you know that the Coeur d'Alene tribal members are in red. And that's because what we were doing, our data collection, the tribe is always a good neighbor. And so every, all the programs that we provide, we serve all students. However, when we were collecting our data, we were not paying attention to just our cord lanes and how they were faring along that pipeline. So we're doing a much better job in terms of our data collection and seeing how they're moving along that pipeline. Below the pipeline are all the programs that are supporting every segment of that pipeline. My job is to negotiate with the public school system and our colleges and universities to help serve our students on and off campus. And we're also looking for continuously federal, state, and private funding sources that can help support every segment of that pipeline. There are multiple federal grants that are supporting we have a Native Youth Community Project Grant that's supporting a college preparation program for both our public school and our tribal school students, grades five through eight. We also have a staff, a group of staff members that are supporting preparing our high school students for college as well. And then the tribe supports all secondary students through PhDs, and the tribe is very generous. They provide uh, full scholarships to all Coeur d'Alene tribal members. And one of the grants that we have, it's a NACTEP, it's a Vocational Technical Preparation Program. That program supports non-natives, and there's individuals that live within our community and plan to stay in our community. This is an illustration of where we started in 1972, where the tribe was just beginning to govern education to where we are today. We're really seeing results at the end of the pipeline. Our, su our success, late, success rate excuse me, is extremely high so that we know the programs are working. It's in the 90% with our two-year students and over 90% with our four-year and our graduate students. Each semester, my staff submit to me a report on the status of our students. That, those two semester reports are then compiled into a year-end report so we know how students are progressing along that pipeline uh, throughout that year. And then that report is presented to our tribal council so that they know where their dollars are going. So, okay. And Shauna is going to share. I do want to point out there are ruptures on that pipeline. It is not perfect by any means. The tribe spent two years studying 
And we seriously lifted up that rug to take a look at what was happening. And what we're seeing is that those ruptures are beginning with our babies. And so we have spent this past year designing a comprehensive plan. And then we are working, as Dick had said, in collaboration with our tribal programs to address those issues and where those ruptures are occurring. So even though we see, beginning with our babies, they begin physically dropping out in their freshman year of high school. But as other, others have said, they do re-enter at that post-secondary level upon receiving their GED. Oh, so, yes, and Sean is going to share how we are addressing some of those ruptures that have occurred. Um, as we all know, that the federal policies are casting a long shadow on that entire pipeline. And so Sean is going to share what one of the programs that we have is doing. Hi, everyone. Um, so as we've been kind of living and breathing um, this pipeline for a number of years now, we started to really identify um, along this pipeline. We have four R's that we have been using um, recently to unpack what the pipeline is showing to us. And so when you go along um, the pipeline from birth through careers, what we are seeing through, um, well, first of all, um, the top of the pipeline shows all of the data that we have been collecting that informs us on where the ruptures are or the gaps of services in the pipeline. And so first, using our data, we identify the ruptures in that pipeline <coughs> or the gaps in services. And then we look at um, our relationships with our local universities, with grants, um, and with our community to begin to repair, restore, and revitalize all along that pipeline from birth through careers. And the program that I am working on, we've identified um, as repairing and restoring is within our local school districts um, through, through our STEP grant, which is State Tribal Education Partnerships. And this grant has been helping us to strengthen our relationships and capacity build within both of our local school districts and with Idaho State Department of Education. And four of our major objectives that we've been working on, um, a major one is fourth grade Idaho history units. We have been um, designing in collaboration. Um, we have a team that works on Saturdays once a month to design this curriculum and that includes all of our fourth grade teachers, community members, University of Idaho representatives, and we have designed a seven unit curriculum that really is framed in a culturally sustaining and revitalizing pedagogy. And so our framework, um, the first thing we did was look at Coeur d'Alene tribal values. We wanted the whole curriculum to be rooted in Coeur d'Alene values. And so we have four pillars, um, stewardship, guardianship, scholarship, and membership. And from that framework, we designed our seven units. And um, our second objective was to work with the state of Idaho to improve the culturally relevancy of the content standards. And so um, we've been working with um, partners all across the state of Idaho to make recommendations to the content standards in which about 96% of our recommendations were approved this year. So we were really excited about that. That was a huge success. Um, 
Another one of our objectives, along with the curriculum that we're developing, is to design professional development modules for teachers and to also um, partner with our universities to strengthen in-service um, programming for teachers as well. Um, and then our last one is to develop three high school social studies um, courses, humanities courses that also include Coeur d'Alene culture, language, and history. So through the, this process, um, some of the partnerships that we have developed are, we've had them, but they have been um, extremely strengthened through this process. Um, we work with the State Department of Education, Plummer Worley School District, Coeur d'Alene Tribal School, um, all of Idaho tribes through our Indian Education Committee, um, University of Idaho faculty, Idaho State University faculty, parents and community members, all of which sit on our um, STEP team to develop curriculum. And from this process, one of the um, most amazing things experiencing um, these relationships is just how far reaching it has gone since we started and our focus is on curriculum but it has expanded to so many um, different areas and stronger relationships um, for example um, we have had stories of teacher retention just from the teachers that participate in this process, designing this curriculum has been culturally relevant um, professional development for them. And so we've heard numerous stories about opportunities that they've had to teach in their hometowns because most of our teachers commute um, into our district who have decided to stay and who have an investment in our community um, we have been down to University of Idaho and been guest presenters in their pre-service um, teacher programs. And then we also have students coming up and teaching in our schools. We have a whole semester long um, University of Idaho pre-service teachers are coming up to our tribal school this semester and doing a digital storytelling project with our third and fourth grade students. Um, and then we also have an indigenous research cohort um, that began through the direction of Dr. Meyer um, out of our tribal education department that University of Idaho has really um, partnered with us on to make happen because that's not something that currently exists at University of Idaho but we are finding a way to make it an indigenous research cohort anyway. <laughs> Sean is in it by the way. <laughs> yes. Um, um, and what else? And just um, having our whole curriculum framework being rooted in tribal values, it's informed a lot of our community's work as well. Um, for example, the Tribal Collaboration Committee that Dr. Meyer mentioned earlier, um, we had shared our, our pillars that we developed in the STEP program with that group that includes our tribal leadership, our chairman, and um, most of our tribal directors and all of them felt so strongly about those values um, they redefined them a little bit each of us kind of made them our own um, but now they're pretty much adopted tribal wide which gives our whole tribe and community a better vision and direction on where we're going so the relationships have been um, just a powerful force in moving us through that pipeline successfully towards restoration. Okay. Kwe Amateur, uh, good morning, friends. Datanyatha Ijatsi, I'm called Etanathya, that's my big turtle clan name. 
Uh, I'm a citizen of the Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma. My name is Barbara Asden, and I serve as Special Assistant to the Provost and Tribal Liaison and Director of Native American Programs at Washington State University at our main campus in Pullman. Let me see. We have five campuses across Washington State and also have, uh, as a land-grant institution established in 1890, we have extension offices in every county. We also are a partner in an extension office with the Caulfield Confederated Tribes, which to my knowledge, I'm not sure if another one in, exists in the country or not, where the tribe itself is actually the partner with university and the federal uh, programs. Um, our Pullman campus is where I'm located and it's on our Pullman campus and our WSU Spokane campus where we have the greatest uh, interaction with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Uh, the Spokane campus is our health science campus where we've just established a college of medicine. Did that do it? Um, in 1997, Washington State University invited tribes to enter into a memorandum of understanding. And the tribes that were invited were all of the federally recognized tribes in the state of Washington, as well as those tribes that had customary land use in what is now Washington State. And that included the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Initially, there were six tribes that were signatory to the MOU. And as of today, there are 12 tribes. I know that that could be expanded, but it's not about just a signature on a piece of paper. It's about relationship, and that's, uh, you know, that this is very time intensive to do this outreach. Um, so anyway, the Coeur d'Alene were one of the original signers to uh, the MOU and have been very active representatives. So the MOU established a, okay, um, it established a Native American advisory board to our president. This advisory board meets twice a year, meets with the president, the provost, other vice presidents, and it also established what is our internal advisory to the provost, and that's made up of faculty staff within the university and it established the tribal liaison position. This has, I would say, one of the challenges is that over this time period, it's now been just about 20 years, we are now have our fifth president and 10th provost. Now, 10 provosts, some of them were interim. Um, the short tenure, uh, it's hard sometimes to tell the difference between the interim and the permanent. But so throughout these transitions, the first thing I do is meet with the new president and ask for that president to honor this MOU. At the time we signed the MOU, I was only aware of one other university that I could learn about that had a position that was something similar, and that was Arizona State. They had a special advisor to the president at that time. Since then, a number of universities have uh, created uh, liaison positions and entered into MOUs. So the primary developments, and of course at the university there's a great deal going on with different colleges and departments who are involved in research or service uh, projects with the tribes. So what I'm focused on right here is what has occurred within our native programming. So in 2013, there was a reorganization of all of our native programs. The advisory board and council had endorsed this in 1999. So 14 years later, our provost at that time really got the picture and reorganized. So it brought together our early outreach, our recruitment, our undergraduate retention services for Native students. We created a graduate student center for Native students and a tribal nation building leadership program. And it also included our Plateau Center for Research and Collaboration, which was created through the advice of the Native American Advisory Board. 
and it also included the tribal community relations. So by bringing together all of these entities, it allowed us to have much greater autonomy and synergy in providing services. And we were able to, one of these pictures is of our staff. So when I began as tribal liaison, it was a part-time position. And you see our staff today where we have been able to grow. At this point, I feel like we're now just kind of bare bones. You know, we've now got some folks we can begin to continue to grow and move things forward. Um, the Plateau Center for Research and Collaboration, uh, we created what we call Plateau Center Affiliates, and these are faculty from across the university who are interested in research or outreach and service with the tribes. And what we've been doing is developing roast, uh, workshops that help educate administration and faculty in relation to uh, indigenous research. Uh, research protocols with tribes, uh, overview of history in that region and of tribal governance and structure and working with tribes. We have an indigenous research conference and this is one that allows both our undergraduate and graduate students that opportunity to uh, really engage in re research and professional development. The Tribal Nation Building Leadership Program came about through working closely with our advisory board. And I need to say that Dr. Myers here was a very pivotal role in the creation of our nation building and pushing that forward. And so this is a program, it's eight semesters, two credits each semester. The Native student comes in and they pursue their area of study. This is accompanies them throughout their four years. They come in as a cohort and uh, it's linked to a scholarship as well. So these are students who are members of the MOU tribes. There we focus on identity, culture, tribal governance and structure and their last year is focused on research relevant to their, uh, their particular area of study and research that's important within the tribal communities. So these are partnerships specific with the Coeur d'Alene tribe uh, back probably about 15 years ago now. The university decided to divest itself of properties outside of the state of Washington. Uh, they owned property on Coeur d'Alene Lake, which was part of the original homelands of the Coeur d'Alene people. However, at that time, the Coeur d'Alene tribe had no lakefront property, if you can imagine that. So this was lakefront property, and to the university's credit, the first thing they did was approach the Coeur d'Alene tribe to uh, negotiate with them uh, the purchase. And the purchase was there was a monetary payment, but also there was a payment where the tribe paid, but we provided educational services in return. And uh, that money went a long ways. We were very good stewards of it. One of the things that is still continuing was the Coeur d'Alene Leadership Camp for Youth. And that has been an excellent program, working very closely with the tribe in terms of their needs. It's held on our campus. And uh, some other things are they just recently got an NSF grant, which is STEM focused, and the Coeur d'Alene is one of the tribes involved with that grant. Um, part of the transfer of Camp Larson established a scholarship program for Coeur d'Alene tribal members. We have what's called the Plateau People's Web Portal, and the Coeur d'Alene have been a part of that since it was established. They determine what goes on that website. There's a front and back side, so the back side can be what's only available to tribal members. And now one of its uses I think that'll be important is in curriculum development and access there. Um, we just held an orientation for our tribal nation building uh, at what used to be Camp Larson and went out on the canoes and stayed overnight and that was a great partnership. So the next thing is that there are five, five colleges and universities that we've come together with. Uh, Washington State's the only one outside of the state of Idaho 
And so it's Northwest Indian College, University of Idaho, North Idaho College. And we work together in how we provide services to the tribes. So I'm watching my time here. Thank you. Did you move me forward one? Yeah. Uh, so together we work on bringing our students together. This is a stick game tournament. Uh, where we compete with one another across the colleges. We work together on trying to work together more closely on course delivery, but uh, there's a lot of challenges in that because some are quarter, some are semester. Uh, and then we've been really looking at how Native students are being identified at our institutions. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Bisbee. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Tots Bailey. Are we still morning? I think we still are. Yeah. I'm Yolanda Bisbee, and I am the uh, Executive Director for Tribal Relations at the University of Idaho and actually the Chief Diversity Officer also for our institution. Um, although that University of Idaho and Washington State are border colleges, uh, the demographics of uh, Idaho is very different than Washington State as we're quite smaller than uh, Washington State. But I think if you see, look on, as you can see on this map, uh, we do have uh, centers at, throughout the University of Idaho. The, they're at Idaho Falls, Boise, and Coeur d'Alene, and we do have a small uh, research center at Twin Falls. Uh, but um, the total population for our campuses is about 11,800. So um, that just kind of gives you a little picture about our, our institution. Um, our population of Native students is about what the national average is. It's one, about 1%. Um, but we, what we try to do is capture all of those students through our um, Native American Student Center. The University of Idaho also entered into a memorandum of understanding with the area tribes, and we have 10 tribes that are on the current MOU with a couple of more who are interested in joining the MOU. Uh, the MOU was signed in 2007, and... Uh, it really, uh, I think the MOU is what is the driving force behind all of our positions as tribal liaisons. Those are the ones where we're out engaging with the community so that we aren't siloing and we're, and we're involved at all different levels uh, with every tribe and knowing what their individual uh, needs are uh, and how the universities can collaborate with them. Um, You'll see I, I uh, mocked my uh, slides after Washington State here, so... Uh, one of the benefits of working with Washington State and BARB so closely is, is that we don't have to recreate the wheel a lot. You'll see a lot of our programs are very similar to Washington State uh, because of our advisory councils that we serve on. Uh, we were both told once by tribes to say, can you get your act together and get our meetings in sync so that we're not over here and over there. And actually, I think we got it going right this time. Uh, she's going to meet with them in the morning, and I'm going to meet with them in the afternoon, so uh, that'll work. But uh, our advisory, our MOU established the Native American Advisory Council to the president. As you saw in hers, hers is the board, ours is the council. And that council is comprised of all of the, uh, tribal, cha the tribal chair or their designee. Dr. Meyer is, uh, is an active member uh, for the advisory council uh, to, at the University of Idaho. We also have a Native American Advisory Board to the Provost, and that board is comprised of the tribal ed directors from those uh, MOU tribes, and so they come together twice a year, as well as the Advisory Council twice a year. What we started implementing with the Advisory Council is, is that uh, to get the president out to tribal communities, uh, we have the fall uh, meeting with uh, the representatives on campus, and in the spring, we, uh, one of the 10 MOU tribes hosts the spring meeting. And so then we move all the meetings out to one of those tribal <laughs> communities. Our primary developments uh, were the creation of the Native American Student Center, and that had been a long time coming. Um, I had been at the university for over 28 years. I received all three of my degrees at the University of Idaho. And uh, as a student advocate, always trying to make sure that our uh, Indian education issues were at the forefront. And so being in a position where I was, uh, we were able to advocate for Advisory Center uh, in 2007. And I think those who know government, governance within administration, it's also about, um, I missed a couple slides. It's also about um, timing and uh, taking advantage of the right time. So our Native Center, 
uh, is a smaller building, but it, it houses most of our uh, Native students where we provide an intensive one-on-one uh, -on -one academic support for all of the students that we bring in. Uh, the creation of the Native Center Director position. When we had our center before we had a director, and so uh, it was, I always like to say, it was all kind of bass backwards on how it was developed, but it was developed. And uh, so this, the director position came out of the uh, uh, development with the, with the tribes as well. The creation of my position uh, came out of the MOU and the creation of the Indigenous Nations Scholars Training for Excellence program. That's what we call our INSTEP, which models the uh, nation building that Washington State does with uh, their students as well. I, I'm hitting my computer and not hitting the screen. So uh, Coeur d'Alene Tribal Partnerships that we have. Uh, we're, since University is a research uh, land-grant university, uh, we have a lot of research that is uh, in, uh, coordinated and collaborated with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Um, and we have been engaged, actually, when I came on it in, uh, as a tribal liaison, um, I made my first visit to Arizona, and mine was actually to U of A with uh, Karen Francis Begay to see what she was doing at her office. And one of the things that uh, really struck our uh, note with me was the research protocol and guidance, the indigenous research protocol and guidance. And so that is developed through my office. So now every research grant or proposal uh, that is out there in Indian country is flagged and it comes through my office for review to make sure that we are uh, partnering in a respectful, collaborative way with the tribes. So when they come and it's, I, I thought it was gonna be a, a hard shift, but the faculty have been actually pretty good once they come in and they uh, understand why we're uh, advising strongly that they bring the tribes to the table at the forefront of a great idea. And uh, so now uh, all the researchers are on board about making sure that the tribes are full collaborative partners and that they're identifying what the needs are for the community and that our researchers are no longer identifying the needs uh, for that research. Some examples of that research were the Back to the Earth which has been an actually substantial project for the Coeur d'Alene tribe. They, it impacted their uh, youth, and uh, it was supporting and improving STEM educational experiences for Native American students, and so it had a lot of hands-on experience. Uh, families in Four Seasons, and it was to promote physical activity in the kids' games and other activities, and I got some pictures there. The Families in Four Seasons, I don't know if the canoe was made out of that one or not. I think it was. Um, and then the Coeur d'Alene uh, UI Graduate Scholarship Program. This is a really close collaboration. When you have the tribe tell you, say, we've got some graduate students down there and we need you to be able to access some of these uh, education funds in order to support them at the university. So we did that and we were able to create a graduate scholarship for the students who were coming in uh, to the university. We also have a American Indian Studies Program course that uh, is now has a tribal sovereignty and federal policy course. This is something we had been working with Dr. Meyer on in a pilot through a grant, a research grant, an NSF grant that she received. Um, and they had were teaching federal policy to all of her Coeur d'Alene tribal members. Well, there's some overlap there as well as we're both on the state Indian ed committee and what we are promoting it and uh, endorsing is that we have uh, federal policy in teacher education uh, so that teacher our teachers are are learning uh, the sovereign status and the federal policy um, that the tribes are operating on because a lot of our teachers and a lot of our community do not understand that and so uh, this was a baby step we're still working on it we're work pushing on it from the state side and the university side to get that into the teacher core curriculum but it is being an offered as an American Indian Studies uh, course now. And then we have, for fun, our Tribal Nations Basketball Night. We had that first time at our um, NCAA basketball game. And we invited, and this actually this group of kids here are all Coeur d'Alene, who uh, came down and uh, they got some playing time on the court. They got shirts. They got to go out and... Uh, be uh, recognized and uh, they had a good time on that. 
Some other Coeur d'Alene tribal partnerships is our HOIST program, which is helping orientate Indian students to the STEM sciences. And this is uh, uh, monies that come from the state. And the Coeur d'Alene uh, generously uh, included HOIST students in their traditional games workshops uh, during the summer. So HOIST students went down there and participated with the Coeur d'Alene tribe on that, as well as we get Hoy uh, Coeur d'Alene students into the HOIST program as well. Um, tribal research guidance and collaboration. Um, we met with the Coeur d'Alene, uh, out of our, our guidance, what we've, what we've developed through the university is an intellectual property agreement that our university is using with all of the tribes to protect, protect, protect traditional knowledge. And that IP agreement is um, uh, unique in that it lets the tribes define what, what they are not going to share and what they are willing to share within that research grant and it gives them full partnership to be a part of that project to be able to identify that. What, what we found when I was talking with the tribes on this is that some of the tribes don't understand how vulnerable they are when we have NSF, you know, big research grants there, and uh, how the, uh, vulnerable they are to FOIA. And so uh, by going out and talking to the tribal communities, we've been able to develop this agreement that has been able to uh, work across different uh, projects with the tribes. And now that we've got it out to most of the 10 MOU tribes, they're all used to the agreement, and I feel good that uh, traditional knowledge is being protected and they're being aware of that and the university is operating in a good way. Dr. Meyer and I uh, met with our lawyers on a project and I think it was, I um, can't remember which one it was, but uh, it also had triggered that uh, the Coeur d'Alene tribe was, uh, was interested in developing their research guidance for their tribe. What we also, what we also discover uh, through Indian country is that there are some tribes who have very good IRB processes and then there's some who do not. And so uh, this has actually stemmed some more discussions for tribes to start looking about how they develop their IRB process for research. State Indian Ed Committee efforts. Um, as of this last meeting, I am now the chair for the State Indian Ed Committee. Uh, Dr. Uh, Meyer was the vice chair, and we come together quite often, I think quarterly almost. Uh, we're on top of it. Uh, we've been on uh, different subcommittees with the state. With, the, with Idaho, the Indian Ed, Indian Ed uh, Committee is under the state board, and we have state board representation, but we are at a disadvantage with our state as we do not have what Washington has what, with the time and memorial curriculum that they're able to integrate into their teaching curriculum. So we are, we are having to really work hard in advocating with the state board in educating them about the sovereign status of our, our tribes and the educational needs for, uh, of our Indian children. And Dr. Meyer is a strong advocate in that. And I think uh, just at these meetings when we're together, we talk about stuff that we need to bring to the state Indian ed committee You know, as we learn these types of things. So very good collaboration. We collaborate, as you saw with the STEP project that Shauna does. We have U of I faculty who are assisting with that. And we also uh, are having an Indian ed Education Summit. And uh, we're, we're asking that those STEP projects come in and share with our uh, College of Education what they are doing in the STEP project with teachers. We have a tri Tribal Law Advisory Board uh, and the uh, lawyer for the Coeur d'Alene Tribe who was the lawyer for the Coeur d'Alene tribe, is now our, uh, f our lead faculty for our uh, Native Law program at the University of Idaho. Uh, and uh, Coeur d'Alene tribe serves on that advisory uh, committee as well. TRIO is everywhere. Uh, TRIO is, uh, works closely with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Um, I think that we need to strengthen those relationships. TRIO doesn't fall under my umbrella of things, but we've started having conversations about how can they be more culturally responsive in their outreach to our tribal communities? And then out of the advisory council, uh, I am one who does not like to meet just to meet. So when we have the advisory council and they're meeting with the president, I, make, I charge them that they need to come away with some kind of initiative or strategy that we need to be addressing. And so out of the advisory council two years ago, uh, the the tribes identified that they needed a natural resource stewardish certificate. And this was workforce development. We know that all of our tribal communities have seasonal um, workers who are uh, working in the summer, who are place bound, who maybe cannot take courses. 
University of Idaho is a land grant institution, uh, a university, and so then it doesn't have that flexibility for a certificate. But the tribes are saying they needed this. So we went to the College of uh, Natural Resources, brought them to the table, had them meet with the advisory council, and they developed the Natural Resource Stewardish certi Certificate, which tribal members can take online. So, um, and it's going to be a 12 or 16 credit course so that they can take it online and start getting a taste of college a little bit. We're thinking about uh, the faculty, the CNR, College of Natural Resources, already talked about developing a native faculty position within their college in order to facilitate those important one-on-ones with the, with the students who are in those online courses and ha possibly making some uh, tribal visits with the cohort of students who are, are in that class. Um, so that's all I've got. Perfect. Thank you very much. Please stay up here. Um, I think if um, uh, Carmen and Matt want to come up, um, Nikki, can you grab a chair and bring one more chair up? Thank you. Um, so we'll get uh, all of the speakers up here. It'll be a little crowded, but I think we'll manage. And now we're going to have, um, we're not going to have Q&A right on this because we're going to go right into our, our uh, discussion section where we'll do Q&A on the full morning. Um, and Sherry Solway Black uh, from the Johnson Scholarship Foundation is coming up to be the moderator. Um, I want to just say before, while she's coming up, um, point out that I did post, for those of you who yesterday know that we uh, started to talk about follow-up work after the conference. Uh, Yolanda says she doesn't like to just meet. So we don't like to just meet either. We want to you know, have some follow-up come out of this conference. Some of the ideas for follow-up that we identified yesterday on that are on the sheet taped up over there on the dividers to the right near Patrice. I put a blank one up there, too, for new groups coming out of today's discussion. There's some markers on the counters to the left and right. You can use your own pen. Put your names up there if you're interested in. Put your ideas up there if you're interested. We will collect those and try to plug people together afterward around some of these ideas. I mean, we heard a lot of uh, good ones here about, uh, to my mind at least, you know, the whole pipeline process, uh, the new, the K through 12 curriculum you developed for uh, schools in Idaho, uh, the, the MOUs. Uh, in the earlier sessions, um, you know, the Fed, you mentioned the Fed, Carmen. We do a lot of work in financial education. You mentioned the tie there with getting people to more aware of FAFSA and tax prep ideas. You know, maybe there is some potential there, for some of the stuff we do. Campus visits, the testing issues, a lot of things in this morning discussion. So bring that up now with your questions in the moderated discussion and think about things you'd like to put your name down to be following up on. We'll go for about an hour here, not quite, and then we'll break, uh, break for lunch. One last thing I did want to do. Alessia, are you here? Would you just stand up? I, I used Alessia's work a lot yesterday. This is Alessia Liebert from the state of Minnesota. I know some of you wanted to uh, talk to her about the data. So, for example, whether she can break out certificates and what happens to certificate holders. So Alessia is here if you want to talk to her at lunch. Thank you, Alessia. Okay, Sherry. Okay, Great. good. Thank you. Um, good morning, and I do think it still is morning. Um, I my bio is in the book, so um, folks can can check that out. But I did want to say that I'm up here as a representative of the Johnson Scholarship Foundation, and I'll say just a little bit about Johnson as it pertains to what we're talking about this morning in a little bit. But as Dick mentioned, this session is for us to move the discussion forward. Uh, with specific follow-up actions. And I do think this morning, you know, he pointed out to a few, um, just a few of the many, many recommend, recommend, recommended um, movements that we could do that the, that the Fed could actually help with, the Center for Indian Country Development. And I think this entity um, is really well poised to, um, to take action 
and to convene people, um, convene us, and to do a lot of the kinds of things that you all talked about this morning. But the question I got that I want to moderate are what are the successes, the gaps, and the opportunities for improvement in how the higher education system serves students from tribal communities? And I think both yesterday and today we heard about this, the successes um, the gaps, the gaps in data, um, and the gaps in services to Native students. Um, and I wanted to just comment on those, and then we can open it up, because this, this is really intended to hear from you all um, questions for the panelists and also your recommendations for moving forward. But some of the kinds of things I heard yesterday um, definitely were improving um, K through 12, the partnerships, which we heard a lot about um, today, MOUs, um, ways to, again, this discussion is really to help us focus on the students. I think the two presentations earlier this morning um, were pipelines for K through 12 um, students and what are the kinds of things we can do very easily, um, educate financial aid officers, ed better education for counselors. Uh, we heard about that. Um, but we also heard things this morning about uh, breaking down the silos, the nation building, how important it is to include nation building in so much of the work that we're doing, the values, the meaning, the context for students. And I think that that is very, very important. Um, so um, again, I, I said I would share something to really kind of trigger um, from the, this discussion from the Johnson Scholarship Foundation. And one third of our programming is on indigenous peoples and it's for scholarships for business and entrepreneurship, for native students in business and entrepreneurship. And we've funded that for 25 years. Um, we've done over 6,500 to funded scholarships for over 6,500 native students for a total of, of well over $18 million. So um, it's, it's important to, um, that we work with the schools. We work with 10 schools continually. We help them build endowments so that they can, um, we can open it up to a new school to add in. So we've, we've um, fostered uh, three endowments at tribal colleges. Also, we have two endowments at the American Indian College Fund for business and entrepreneurship. And the, so, um, our work with those tribal colleges helped us to identify an issue that the tribal college folks told us about, which was their professors, their instructors, needed more education themselves. And so in um, 10, 11 years ago now, we um, set up a program with Gonzaga University uh, for a master's in business administration in American Indian entrepreneurship. And it was specifically for tribal college instructors who wanted to get a master's degree um, to improve themselves to go to Gonzaga, and that's how it started out initially. And then it, um, and it really is like an executive MBA. They go in the summer, again, trying to be responsive to their needs as professors, as instructors, um, that they could not take off during the academic year. So they, in fact, went in, um, um, they did weekends during the semester, they did um, six weeks during the, uh, the summer and they were cohorts. Um, and that's a very important thing that I think we heard um, this morning um, as well. So we've, we've now had um, over 60 um, um, students who have gotten their master's in business administration there. We did an evaluation when there were 48 graduates and we spoke with every single one to say what was meaningful to you, you know, how has your career advanced, how are you helping better able to help students. So again, it was really this process of learning from the students, you know, what are the kinds of things that are better able um, to help you. But what was so important, and I think we really heard this morning, was personal coaching. We have a, two people at Gonzaga who help these students tremendously. They walk, you know, help them through um, financial aid, other kinds of financial aid through um, test taking and a variety of different kinds of things. And they as a cohort come together, um, you know, that they can work together, um, study together, they have networked with each other. So we're, we're um, fortunate. So I wanted to just share that that's one of the, uh, another example of, of 
cohorts and how important they are to our students and also this coaching that we heard from a variety. We heard it from Matt. We heard it from Carmen um, this morning. So I wanted to just open it up um, to folks to what are the kinds of concrete steps and questions for the, for the panelists. What are the kinds of steps we could do from here? What did we hear this morning? Um, I know we heard that, you know, scalable kinds of things. I don't like the word replicate because I don't think you can ever really replicate anything. But what can the Federal Reserve, what can the Center for Indian Country Development do to help, um, help us take the kinds of good things that we're hearing from this and move, help to move us forward um, and some recommendations? So um, that's enough from me. Let's hear from, from the group. Again, questions for panelists and also um, what are the kinds of things we could, we could do? We have a, one in the back. Good morning. Uh, this is for Carmen. I um, really enjoyed your presentation, and thank you so much for the hard work that you're doing uh, with your College Horizons program. Um, with respect to college admission advisors, those people who um, are the first to see student records and um, their statement of interest, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we've done at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire is to bring in the multicultural student affairs people so that there is an ability for the admissions to see and understand where that student actually is coming from and to share those kinds of stories that they need to hear in order to know that they are definitely doing something for the greater good. And um, with respect to uh, the college's re Board of Regents, that they understand that as well, so that there isn't any place where uh, a bias can exist. And removing that whole element of, well, we don't think that you're worthy because you don't have the GPA thing, but that you're going to get there with this kind of support instead. So that's just an example of maybe something that could be thought about is to exercise and leverage those people who you already have at the universities to work with your team um, to ensure that uh, when you talk about you know, the, the things that go on with admissions counselors, that on the ground they can also provide that support to students. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's, there, you, you touched on one thing that's really important when we're moving, this, this goes to the data collection yesterday from when a, a student checks the box in the admission process and then when they move through through financial aid and matriculation and then actually become an alum of the institution, that designation doesn't follow along with them. So even in our work at, at Harvard, um, I know both Shelley and I would go to the university development office and say, I want the list of all the native uh, alumni from Harvard schools. And there was no comprehensive list because it didn't follow along. And many of the universities now, of course, have different SIGs, special interest groups, as part of their alumni association. So, so now they're catching up and realizing that I'm going to donate to a program that's important to me um, as, as an alumna. Um, and then the, the, what's really critical, too, when we're talking about um, race, ethnicity, and citizenship from admissions to matriculation, for that native student community on campus. What happens when you have the self-identification of 100 students, you know, 50 of them matriculate, and then 10 of them are engaged in, in the work of, of that university around Indian affairs? That's the part that admissions, I think, really needs to understand, is what does it mean when you're tracking numbers and along that self-identification? Um, I'm not going to argue about um, checking the box and whether someone, the, the cultural, um, how in depth a student might know and understand their culture. Because I, at College Horizons, we have students who, who, who don't have that cultural knowledge, and there's a reason why they don't. Um, 
but I'm making the space for them to come in and to start to, to grapple with that. Um, and I understand what that means for later with that planting the sh seeds of nation building. I would want admission officers and um, universities to grapple with that and understand it truly uh, when we're talking about nation building and capacity development. You need to understand who those students are coming who they are, how they're coming in, and if you're nurturing that support of their community development. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, that's the other part that we're not realizing from admissions to the community that's being built on that college campus. Um, it's important to, to, to think that through. So I'd like to address that as well. Um, so when we talk about the pipeline, there, that's where we've got a rupture at, is when we've got extensive services in, in K-12 to get them there and then handing them off to the admissions mm -hmm. to be able to, to come in. So what I task my office with, and this is something that could be easily addressed if, if everybody's paying attention to where they're sending their students to, is who is that Native American center or that director on that college campus that that's who you tie them to. You don't worry about the admissions. Mm -hmm. You worry about connecting them to that person within that Native community on that campus. Um, and that's where we could use some probably uh, some support within a, a, a database. We always go back to the database again about getting that resource out to our, our tribal communities. If that relationship is built with that student, that relationship should also be built with the tribes. And so they should know. So if Dr. Meyer is sending me someone from Coeur d'Alene, I should be able to know right away that she's sending me someone from Coeur d'Alene. And Norma will tell us she's sending someone from Coeur d'Alene. She's got a student there. What does his aid package look like? They're missing this. So those are the, those are the linkages that need to be done with higher ed um, that not everybody does or are aware of. We have, there's two in the back there, but this woman right here first. Hi, um, my name is Amy Locklear Hotel. Um, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Lumbee Nation and director of the American Indian Center at UNC Chapel Hill. Also faculty in social work, and I wanna say thank you um, to all of our presenters today. You're talking about the pipeline um, in, in such a way that it's um, not just higher ed focused, right? It's K through 12, but it's also where do our students go when they graduate? How are we releasing them back into their community so that they're prepared with the skills and the competencies that they need for nation building or for being um, service leaders in their home communities? So thank you for sharing all of that. I also wanna say that, you know, for those of us at institutions where we're sort of catching up and where we're learning how to serve native nations, um, I want to, you know, the internet's very helpful, um, and having your MOUs available electronically so that we could look at them at UNC and Chapel Hill and really compare how are they doing this work in Washington and in Idaho, that's been tremendously helpful for us. And so I haven't had a chance to connect with you all personally. I think spaces where those of us in this kind of work can connect and talk and share stories, but also disseminate information is critically important. Um, so we have developed an MOUs with the eight tribes in the state of North Carolina. We're doing service work as well. But you all, you know, we're following behind you. And I want to say thank you to you all, ASU too, for all the work that you're doing. Um, but these, when you're asking the question how to help, these types of environments to make connections, but also that dissemination aspect. Mm -hmm. And the question that I have for you is I know at the center that I direct, when it was founded 10 years ago, it had one person. Um, and now we have six people total. Um, a lot of the funding that we receive, though, to support five individuals um, comes from foundations. And I was wondering if you could talk some more about your growth over time um, in Idaho and Washington and how that growth has been supported. Is it by the state? Is it by tribes? Is it by foundations, donors? If you could speak some to that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Josh, I can go ahead. Uh, one thing important at Washington State University uh, the MOU was signed 20 years ago, and often I feel, you know, I would like to have seen greater progress, but over time, all of our programs are state-funded. Um, you know, I've seen the programs at university where it was based on a grant. They operated the program four or five years, and then it went away. So everything I described is state-funded. This year, for the first time, we have faced a budget cut. And uh, our program was protect, 
uh, protected through about 2008, 2009, when the state of Washington had some pretty serious budget. Uh, our program was protected and we even added positions. So the university has had a strong commitment. Now this year is, uh, I, it's pretty tough because for the first time we're, we are sharing in the budget cut that's going on in certain areas of the university. About two years ago was the first time we applied for some grant support from uh, one of the tribes. And part of it was my philosophy. I, you know, as soon as there were casinos, the university would come and say, oh, can we go to them for money? And, you know, I don't know. I just felt like, let's prove ourselves. Let's show the tribes first that there's really a commitment here. Mm -hmm. And you're going to show that commitment by state funding for what we're doing. And, you know, I think the university's done a pretty good job there so far. And so we've just started going out and uh, talking to tribes about money. We do have some privately funded scholarships that also help support our recruitment and retention. But that's primarily, it's been state funded. Does anyone else want to? Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I became interim in the position in 2013, I believe, when my predecessor had passed. And at that time, he was the only position in the office, and he was kind of tucked out in a little hole in the back of the administration building. Um, but since then now, I've gained two staff, which are split between the diversity office and myself, but it's, it's, I've got two other staff now who are on the ground assisting with other things, and it is all state-funded. Um, so uh, I actually, and it, it really depends on your leadership. And, and how you inform and educate your president, that sovereign relationship with the tribes. Too many times what happens is they want to put them into the underrepresented population and they're uh, multicultural, but you, you make that strong stand that this is a sovereign nation and we're, doing, we're having government-to-government -government relationships with that tribe. So um, the pres my president understands that now, and so he has been very uh, supportive in giving me the resources that I need to keep growing the program. Um, I told him, and I think he said he's going to retire in like six years, and I think I'm going to retire then because I don't want to go through another president. <laughs> who, who, I don't want to be there when something happens with the money. But um, and yes, I am that old. I can retire. <laughs> Carmen or, or Matt, do you want to address the, the funding issue at all? At, well, no, I, I can talk a little bit about it, too, from Johnson Scholarship Foundation. You know, we, we, one of our strategies is definitely setting up endowments so that there is a continual source for these scholarships, and we ask the institutions to match that um, funding. It's a little difficult at tribal colleges. We set up the two at the American Indian College Fund as a way to fund tribal colleges that can't set up endowments. But it, tr at native serving institutions where we work, uh, we work with Oklahoma State University, Northeastern and Oklahoma Heritage in Washington, um, and Gonzaga, we're working on an endowment now where we ask the, the institution to have a commitment to match the endowment. So, um, you know, to really look at how can we leverage other, other funds for this. So. Did we, yeah, we had someone. Hi, I'm Sue Galatowicz. I'm a professor of, uh, head of fisheries and wildlife at the University of Minnesota. And I was particularly interested in some of the, uh, the ideas on related to research ethics and uh, intellectual property protection for TEK and also the, uh, the research, the indigenous research review. Um, and I have a couple of follow-up questions for L L uh, Yolanda. Um, first of all, um, when do you do, the, so three questions, when does that review take place? Is it pre-proposal? Who's on the advisory group that provides that review? Mm -hmm. And then second, or thirdly, can you tell us a little bit about the weight of the outcome of that process, mm -hmm. say, compared to human subjects? It's, it's not, what, we have our IRB who handles all of the, the IRB process. All I'm doing is, is connecting to make sure that they are they have full collaboration and the tribe is aware and working with them on the project. So IRB will go through and review the, the, the research 
and then it, it gets pinged and it comes to me if it, they happen to select a tribal community. So we work with Banner and IPERS through the research. And so on, well, there's a line item that says, are you working with the tribal community? And if they click it, it comes right to my email. And then I'm on top of it to, tell, to, t to reach out to that researcher, say, why don't you send me an abstract? Tell me a little bit about your, uh, your research and who are you working with? So and does that happen pre-submission? Because that's oftentimes a very tight turnaround. Yeah, it is a tight turnaround. Um, a lot of them already, those that are already working within Indi Indian country already are aware that they're having to do that already and they'll have somebody on board. Um, it, it's put out that they need to be able to, to make those connections. It's not on my website yet because it's, I've, I've been short-staffed a little bit, but it's going up. And so it's been really by... Um, process that they all of the colleges pretty much know that they need to be doing that before it comes to me or if they're wanting to engage with the tribes they usually come to me and say who would my connection be in order to talk about this project so um, it's it's going pretty well I've maybe only caught one or two off off the cuff that had said I just found this project uh, two weeks I need it funded I, who can I get this to sign off on the tribe and I'm and it's not going to happen you know so um, so what happens in that case where they they don't they don't pursue the project? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And one thing I might offer is National Congress of American Indians, and I know there are others out there, um, has a curriculum called "Walk Softly, Listen Carefully" about working with tribes on setting up um, your research protocols. So that's one um, resource that's available as well. Do we have any other comments or recommendations? Did I see your? One thing I'd thought of too, oh, here we go. We have one over here. Carl Lawrence, University of Minnesota and tribal member of the Lummi Nation in Northwest Washington. Um, just a quick follow up. When are the tribes involved? I mean, I know that I hear that the, the proposal, the research proposal goes to your office for review. Are the tribes then asked to comment on particular uh, research that's you know undergoing on their lands and in their interest? Or is it strictly through your office? If they're related to education, uh, the researcher will contact me ahead of time. And we, I make a decision on whether we want to participate in that project and whether it's going to benefit our pipeline work. And that's the case with other tribal entities, is they will make contact with them first. Mm -hmm. And then again, they decide on whether it's going to benefit the tribe. The tribe is the one that makes the decision on whether that research is going to um, benefit us. And we've not been there before. Um, mm -hmm. We make that decision first. And that decision is a go or no go on the research? Yes, so that's the right. And the researchers will withdraw mm -hmm. if there's a substantial mm -hmm. opposition from the tribe. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we've had some, as uh, Dr. Bisbee had shared that tried to be very aggressive and I just said no. Mm -hmm. I think when, one of the things is, uh, is educating our faculty on the shift and, and rethinking about community uh, engagement, consultation, collaboration mm -hmm. on a project. Um, I, I tell everybody right, right up front, no longer are our institutions defining the needs for our tribes. Mm -hmm. The tribes are sovereign nations and know what their needs are. And so um, I do get some faculty upset because it's, it's about research and scholarship for themselves when they're looking at, at dollars. But if they're committed to wanting to impact Indian communities, then they should be able to take it that next step and have full collaboration. So um, it's, a, it's a shift in, in, uh, in how they're thinking about research. And I think one of the things we're doing through our Plateau Center is developing those workshops and trainings for faculty and administration and stressing that this is about relationship. And it's also about the long haul. It isn't popping in, doing this one research project with a grant. It's about what is your commitment? This is a long-term relationship with tribes and benefiting tribes. So once again, trying to make a shift in how it's being viewed uh, in terms of working with tribes. Mm 
Most of the research is done with our 10 MOU tribes that are in their area. I've had to make some visits down to uh, Nevada for some tribes who were signing on the agreement just to explain, you know, the where and why we were doing the agreement. But all of the tribes, their councils and usually their education director departments know that if somebody is coming to them for research, that they know that they should have contacted my office or are working with them. So if they get a researcher who comes in, um, I actually had one uh, for my own tribe say, uh, Yolanda didn't give me a heads up on this. Um, have you talked with Yolanda on this? And they say no. And they said, well, I'm not signing off on this until you've met with Yolanda because this is not something that I'm aware of that anybody else has signed on in the tribe, but you're coming in and want me to sign and, and be a partner on this grant. And so she sent the researcher back, and um, we talked about it. And then I, I went to Joyce, and I said, okay, um, is this something that you can, that you would like to have? And she says, well, we could, but we're not, we haven't been in, involved in, in the discussions about the framework, you know, what the program's looking like. And I said, if he comes back and works with you on that, are you willing to discuss that with him? And she says, yeah. And so then they go, he goes off and he does that. <laughs> But it was just kind of creating those, that avenue for discussion again because they had gone in without touching base with anybody and trying to get the grant done. So um, it's kind of uh, introducing and, uh, and engaging more at, a, at that relationship level. I, I wanted to raise a um, sort of a more fundamental question. One of the things we have represented up here um, with the uh, Coeur d'Alene tribe is a tribe that has put education as a high priority, Educate the pipeline from cradle to career. Um, tribes have so many priorities, and I would like to hear from people in the audience and others up here is, and um, President Kashkari this morning said, with th these kind of statistics, why isn't there just this absolute crisis to say we have to do something for our children? Um, about this. So how do you, um, what are the strategies for engaging tribes to them to know that this is education is such a high priority when they have so much on their plates? Um, and how do you move this forward with tribes to, to engage them? So from panelists or folks in the audience who have done it or who are working on that? I might share something that's developing there in the Northwest. There's the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, and that is uh, an association of tribes, Eastern, let's see, Western Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Southern Alaska, Northern California, and Northern Nevada. There's usually about 58 tribes that have a membership with AT&I. And just last week we was the annual convention of at and I, though they meet three times a year. And we've been moving towards, I mean, they, you know, we are active in their meetings as well, but um, moving towards creating an education branch that is within at and I. So far they have an economic development branch, a climate, and a natural resources, which is the most recent. But the education branch would elevate this, uh, the imp education, and it would help uh, provide staff support. We're also working with uh, Education Northwest. They did this research project on the misidentification of Native students that we've talked about. I think they all have a handout. Yeah, you have out. a handout now. So I think as tribes, as a tribal organization, this is just now being discussed. It has not become a reality yet. Mm -hmm. But they're gathering the information and looking at what it might look like, and that will elevate the uh, focus and attention on education among all of these tribes. Mm -hmm. Sherry, maybe I, I'm going to. We had one question I haven't answered yet. I can't remember. Oh, here. Yeah. We'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just anyway. wanted to. I just wanted to follow up and ask if there were strategies that other populations um, that, or advice that you would give other populations. Um, Native communities aren't um, singular in their desire to protect their history, um, their culture from external uh, research. 
And so are there any, um, is there any advice or strategies that you could give to other communities as they struggle with similar who don't have uh, tribal sovereignty as a, a tool? Mm -hmm. So uh, as the chief diversity officer, I also have a Latino advisory uh, committee to the president. And uh, they are starting to be uh, more aware uh, and being approached more on research uh, from the institutions that would target their communities. Um, the universities are also all going out to uh, communities with high populations of Latino students in them. And so I, I, from my side, know those researches and I'm working with them. I'm often brought to the table on that as well. And I'll say, who do we have from that community on the, on the committee or who's working with us? And they'll say, oh, that's a great idea, you know. So um, there isn't anything in place there, but it is a, it's a best practice for me to make sure that, that we're paying attention to that. Um, I just hate being, we, we got to quit thinking that we can speak for everybody. Uh, and I think um, as long as we keep saying that over and over again, I think it'll start resonating with everybody. Carmen, did I see? Um, I, I'm going to jump back on the last one of um, solutions as I was thinking if I've got the Federal Reserve Bank's attention. Um, <laughs> so, and this is actually, this is applies to Washington State. So, so there's some incredible college access organizations in Washington. Um, um, the National uh, College Access Network, I'd really recommend for both university folks and tribal educators to check out that organization because they're like us. They're, they're the... Uh, they're the nonprofits outside of the schools that are trying to help fill certain needs. One of the research, and, and Washington State has done this really successfully with certain um, access organizations. Um, if we, so we've got what, 650,000 native children, K through 12. Um, if we gave each child either a 529 savings plan or an IDA plan, 25 bucks to start them off in kindergarten. Uh, maybe that's 45,000 students, I don't know, in kinder. Um, they have a three times more likelihood of going on to college if that kinder has a 529 savings plan or an IDA savings plan. I think there is a, tri is it Coeur d'Alene? I, I, I can't remember. There was a tribe that has Quin created. Quinault. Quinault. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is a way, tw what if we invested $25 in a child? You know, your child is worth that to me. My child, I have three children, um, is worth that. Um, so that's what, 650,000 times um, 25 bucks, that's $16 million, you know? Mm -hmm. Who can step up to the table to do that? We've got incredible, um, um, not only foundations, but corporations with their own foundations and investment strategies that could surely contribute to that. So there, there mm -hmm. are things like that outside of the box that we know is working, mm -hmm. not only um, for uh, native children, but for any other child out there. So there, there's a lot of these types of ideas um, that are mm -hmm. as simple as helping uh, an individual get their taxes completed so they could then fill out the FAFSA to $25 for every uh, native child in, in America to start an IDA or a savings plan. Easy. So there are children's savings accounts. There's a law, actually, in, in looking at doing that. But in San Francisco, every child in San Francisco starts in kindergarten with uh, $50, and that's added to. And then it's matched by parents, by grandparents, by others, similar to a 529 uh, plan, too. So that is. Uh, we have a question. In, um, Dick, did you want to caution me? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Ben Horowitz with the bank here in the Community Development Department. Uh, thank you all for sharing your time and knowledge on how institutions face students and the work you're doing to improve those facings. I'm, I'm curious about something that felt like it was embedded in all of your work, which was also in changing how students face each other, which seems like such an important part of a student's success in higher ed. And I'm curious if that shows up in your evaluations of your work as an important feature and maybe when you are seeking funding, whether it's from outside funders or foundations or from institutions like university, if that's a tougher sell or what the kind of attitude is around that. And I guess maybe for the broader room, what sort of research people might be aware of on the importance of social networks and success for 
higher ed students. Is that how peer to peer? Are you talking about when they're in college and and how they're socializing as as cohorts or within a native student center? Uh, I guess all of the above. So uh, we've had a lot of great conversation about how students um, and the way institutions treat them plays into student success or lack thereof. Um, you're also doing a lot of great work. It sounds like across the board and finding ways for students to interact with each other and uh, create new opportunities for social networking and uh, peer group support. Uh, does that show up in any of your internal evaluations? Does it show up in the broader academic research? Is there interest in that? Or is it, you, you, you particularly mentioned how it's important not to get too focused on test prep and things like that. Is that one alternative that you see as being really connected to success. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And uh, okay, hello? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> it's not like I call it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's absolutely, in our work that we work with our students, certainly the peers, um, especially participating in our program, you know, we because we're not in the community and we're showing up two or three times a year and we're showing up at their school and they're like, who are these people? And, and usually when we connect with the right student, they're like, oh, they signed up, and then we're gonna sign up, right, or we're gonna go. And especially even just for my own personal, not even research, I mean, that's how I applied to college. All my friends were applying, and I was ready to go to the Army, and I was like, all right, I'll, I'll apply to <laughs> Central Michigan, and my buddy got in, and so I went, I was like, all right, we're gonna go to Central Michigan, and he's like, all right, I'm applying to Michigan State. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, okay. So I applied to Michigan State, and then he didn't get in, and I got in, and then, yeah, we're, I mean, like I said, we're not friends now, but <laughs> you know, we're still friends. Like we just, yeah, we're just two different parts. So, um, but it happens a lot in the students that we're working with. It's, it's, hmm. it's, it's if their friends are going, if they're applying, it helps with their confidence in terms of that they're going to do that. And, I, and I'm sure there is research out there. I'm trying to forget what it is in terms of. There is, there is one with, um, with a tribal college study with Dr. Iris Pretty Paint, heavy runner. Um, and she did it on family engagement mm -hmm. in the tribal college community. So when I was looking, doing my research, that's kind of one that stuck out for me on the emphasis of this community and family engagement. Um, I don't know, maybe any others? Dr. Brayboy might know of other research. I think that, you know, the, um, that social capital, you know, when, when you're looking for those different type of language things. At College Horizons, that is fundamental to our work, is bringing kids from different tribal nations and that diversity and bringing them together. And we have the, the motto, College Pride, Native Pride. Um, and that is so central for these native nerds to see one another mm -hmm. and to be like proud of their academics and their pro uh, projects, or some of them are athletes, some of them are not. Um, it is so critical to get them with one another, college like-minded students. Um, and also, we have to talk about that pain and my um, the things that I've been experiencing that I haven't really shared with other other people because I need them to know that um, that there are other successful native students that are from single parent homes. There are women that um, we've had students that um, have children that have come to College Horizons. Women that have experienced sexual assault and violence um, that are going off to college. That are young men of color um, going off to college. So. Uh, they need to see other excited, motivated, like-minded students um, and, and have this energy. That's the, that's the beauty and the magic and the ceremony of College Horizons is, is the relationships. It's gathering them together um, and having this energy for us to be sustained for that week. And then that follows, Dr. Brayboy was asking me about that last night, is like, how are those, we do cohort-based things, uh, peer groups. Um, those guys we identify by small groups. So it's like, small group one, small group six, and they all have their cheers. 
And they follow each other I I through college, and they're not at the same campuses. That's the really interesting mm -hmm. thing. In the scholars program, we're doing cohort-based as well, because I, uh, Susquehanna University, people don't know that college, they sent four of their students to our scholars program. We got them together before they stepped foot on that campus this fall so that they'd have one another as they went to that. And these students were real rural Arizona kids. So I was like, yes, th that's who we need to have in our scholars program. So I, I, I wouldn't underestimate, and I'd, I'd say to ask Dr. Brayboy of those other, uh, their research, but um, that is critical. Native people, this is, that's what we live in, is community and gathering and family and relatives, and I'm the auntie at the program. I'm not executive director, Carmen Lopez, I'm auntie. And I'm gonna come down hard with auntie love sometimes, or I'm gonna really cuddle and, and embrace my students. But that's the shift that I'm trying to make to relate to these students. And we had one other uh, major um, question. I'm oh, sorry, I'll take the, the one last answer. one. And Hi, I'm Derek Oxenon from the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, and my question is mainly for Carmen. Um, I've seen your data in your 2017 demographics that you sent out that only 25% of your participants are Native men. And I'm wondering, is, is that average? Do you see that from year to year? Um, just wondering, have you reached out to tribal communities to say, hey, we need your guys? Can you tell them about this program? It's awesome. We need to get more applicants. You know, is it the fact you're not getting applicants or are the, the applicants suck when you get them and you, they can't be admitted? Um, you know, as a native man, I'm really interested in that. And, you know, I've got two of my brothers here from UNC Pembroke as well. And we see that on, on our campus that the men aren't stepping up. We have had a, having a lot of conversations about that. And um, just wondering what you're finding in that, if you've been able to unpack that a little bit to see what's going on there. Yeah, we're, we're generally around a 30 to 35% um, with our, our young men in the program, and that's been consistent for the last, I don't know, eight years that I've been at College Horizons. Um, and um, that when we do our outreach at the high schools and doing the information sessions, we do have a minimum GPA requirement of a 3.0 GPA. Um, that's still a ABC student or a BC student, um, so it, it's not, uh, some of the criticism we can get at College Horizons is that we're cherry picking and getting the best and the brightest of Indian country, but we actually have a really broad range academically. When I read though for, for our young boys, I do read them differently and I'm looking for some different things in their application. They can be rough around the edges, right on that border of the GPA. Um, and um, I'm really looking at their essays and, and trying to pull out of their, um, do, are they bored? <laughs> are they just, you know, having, having their reaction to having a really awful teacher um, or an awful counselor and they're, you know, gonna be real with them and it translates a certain way. Um, and then I call, I tend to call before I make an admit decision on, on some of our young men, I'll call them directly and say, um, you applied, I've got some more questions for you. And one young man was from here in Minneapolis. Oh man, he turned it around on me so brilliantly. I'm calling to try to interview him and he says, well, why do you think I should be coming to your program? Uh, you know, aren't you, <laughs> are, aren't you sending students, he, he talked about brain drain. He didn't have the word brain drain, but that was exactly what he asked me is like, aren't we, de you know, depleting from Indian country by me going off to this white college? You know, why should I be doing that? And I love it. I was like, admit it. You know, I was already like, all right, I'm admitting you, even though I haven't even asked you the questions I wanted to. Um, and it's that that I'm looking for, the inquiry. Um, um, and, and I'm trying to find it. Uh, Melvin um, is great with the non-cognitives in, in the, the Cobell scholarship, asking very different types of questions now. So um, they're there. I know we've got to be addressing it. I don't have a developed program. I've just started um, a couple of, at Amherst College, I had the masculinity program at UMass come in and work with us. Um, when we go to, to Hawaii next year, working with our Hawaiian young men, I'm gonna ask a classmate of mine, um, uh, Tai Tengen. Uh, he focuses on Hawaiian masculinity. I'm gonna 
um, have him come in to work with us. So um, I, I'm working on this with our young men, but I do think that you have to read them differently and you're trying to suss out something. And I need them to buy into my program. There's one other person I would recommend, Nolan, Nolan Cabrera from the University of Arizona. He teaches about masculinity and how young men of color will respond to a female instructor or a female teacher or a female mm -hmm. coach differently than a male. So I need to recognize that in my teaching too, that I'm gonna take, I, they're gonna listen to me so far and then I've gotta find my, my brother, my uncle, to, to, to go have a conversation with them too. Um, because I, I'm, you know, in, in our native roles, we have camps and societies and women's societies and men's societies that take those certain relational roles again. So I think you have to be conscious of it. To me, they're there. Um, they're, they're, they're falling through early on in that sixth and seventh, the middle school behavior, right? That's where we see the truancy, where they start to get tracked down a certain pathway. So um, there's places that we've gotta go back even further um, for our boys um, into elementary and, and middle school, junior high school to help them, help them out. But they're there. I think that would also be a good, uh data set is to see out of all of our native student service programs how many what are the uh, the sex mm -hmm. of the of the leaders in that you know is it mainly female mm -hmm. you know um, we had a native center director uh, Steve Martin at uh, U of I and he <coughs> built this cohort of young men who were all on target to graduate and they're they're disappearing now but he had built this good cohort of young men that he started a, a our vandal nations drum and now that he's gone, we've got a, a female native director, and I don't see that momentum again. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was that, that male presence within that native center that made that draw. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so Good. Krista, I'm still in shock that I'm at uh, uncle level, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I am. Um, but I'm on, I'm on the, as we talk about the college, I'm on the grumpy old man uncle level. <laughs> and so if I can be grumpy just for a second, um, I mean, the, the, the issue, and again, when we go into schools as often, we'll have counselors or whoever it might be, is let me bring you the students that we think are college ready, mm -hmm. right? And so they're already tracked out of it, and I'm like, well, you better be bringing me everybody if they're college ready, right? That's, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And that happens, and it doesn't matter if they're native or non-native, that happens often. And so we, we need to really, and, and I probably need to do a better job too, uh, of talking to our, our native male youth about that, about you can go to college, you can succeed, right? That it doesn't matter if the whoever's helping you or guiding you says, you know, ah, I mean, I was, we were helping people apply to college, and um, I won't say where, and the counselor was like, well, he was, they were applying somewhere that wasn't part of the free ones, and they were just kind of doing their own thing, and she said, well, I'm not really worried about that person. They're, they're not going to college anyways. Oh, and I was like, like really? You, you know, um, I mean, it's, you know, I've had counselors say, you know, our, our next group of class is, uh, is our um, special, or what they call them, our goofy kids. And I was like, oh, all right, you know, this is, I'm goofy too, right? Like, this is gonna be good. And she's like, yeah, and she leans in closer. And it's like, yeah, there are um, special ed class. And I was like, <laughs> you know? And so, and so when we talk about our youth, we, that's why I could go back to it. We need people who care mm -hmm. in general, native or non-native, you have to have that general care because um, the, the thing about youth is they have the ability to either spot if you're gonna be fake with them or not. Right, they know that and they can see it. It's, I don't know, maybe we lose it as adults, <laughs> but <laughs> kids don't lose that, and so they know, and so you have to have that or it won't work. And so, but I agree. I know Dr. Braveway, they had their study with the native male indigenous boys and youth, and I know at the college fund we have a scholarship uh, specifically for native males that we're also going to do a little bit more programming with that and, and, and try to flush that out. Thank you, thank you, and I, I know we are. Yeah, I'm gonna start wrapping up. I wanna do... Um, I saw somebody's hand Yeah, there's here. a lot of hands here, I'm, I'll, uh, lots of them. So maybe we'll run a little long. Um, I know Nikki wants to make a statement too, so we got, maybe we'll try to work in, you got two here, I guess, but um, bef I wanna actually ask, and, and this may not go nowhere, but um, I'll exempt uh, Cynthia Lindquist, because she's speaking this afternoon, but for the, there's a number of tribal colleges here. I know we've got Leech Lake and a number, uh, Red Lake, some others from 
I think maybe Le Couture, uh, Le Couture is here. Uh, with what, what Sherry was talking about in terms of the, you know, what's your perspective on uh, getting buy-in from tribal leadership, making it a priority when there's so many other things to do? Um, is anyone from, you know, Leech or Red Lake, Le Couture, if they're here, or any other tribal college that um, have a response? That I just, I would just like to hit that one more time, Sherry, mm -hmm. if it's okay with you. Sure. And if if not, we'll move on. I don't want to. Go ahead. Dan, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dan King, president, Red Lake Nation College. I think mm -hmm. that's really critical for the tribes to support the tribal colleges as far as higher education. And I think it's really up to us in the tribal colleges to make sure our tribal councils understand that. And that includes going to the council meetings every month, uh, staying in close touch with your council members, and really just stressing the importance for the entire community. That's part of our job, I think, as presidents to do that. And like with our, co our tribe, our tribe actually invested in an $11.4 million brand new campus and almost a million dollars a year in operational funding to support our tribal college. And to me, if they wouldn't have done that, that would have never happened in our, in our college. So I think every tribal college needs to make sure they're emphasizing higher education and they're reaching back into the high schools with PSEO programs and similar type programs that help the transition into high, into, from high school to college. And, and uh, just if Minnesota has a PSEO, that's post-secondary educational uh, yeah. Yeah. option, I believe, where high school students can take their student aid to a participating college in their junior and senior year in high school if they meet certain criteria. And mm -hmm. So you're using that, I take yep. it? Yep, exactly. Okay. And that, could I offer just one t thing I thought about? Um, National Congress of American Indians, National Indian Health Board, um, National Indian Child Welfare Association, um, National American Indian Education Association are, have come together to work on an initiative called First Kids First. And in essence, it's you know directed to tribal governments to really recognize that you know putting our children first. But it's really their intention with the campaign is also to engage every single person in Indian Country to recognize they can do something for our kids, and so um, you know recognize them, you know congratulate them. Um, Salish Kootenai, they are looking at it. Um, uh, uh, children's success um, strategy where they're tracking every single child in their communities and I know others are too so they so it's almost like an inventory of these kinds of activities that are happening to uh, you know to really help people and do we have time for these two questions here well, um, ladies here yeah Nikki we'll let you wrap up two we'll do the two on the table here and by the way in, in asking about the tribal support I'm in no way trying to undercut what President Lindquist said yesterday about the importance of state funding or what we've talked about in terms of trust responsibility, too. But you got one, and you can have this one. Um, my name is Pearl. I'm from um, North Coast State University um, in the Department of Public Health. Um, just wanted to maybe share this idea um, since we're having this talk about um, the low rates of um, American Indian men going into college. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, not seeing a lot of them um, apply and uh, go through programs. So um, would it be possible to maybe um, for the Center for Indian Country Development and um, maybe other, other um, organizations that are here to partner on a social media campaign for masculinity um, and have maybe a shared curriculum that is adaptable to each, each tribe on, um, Having education um, is sure. being a warrior. You know that is a masculine um, thing to be a provider um, with education. So you know that was just kind of an idea that I I thought I would um, share um, and maybe pose to those in the room. And also I was just interested. Um, I'm also a birth doula, and so when you mentioned Chris in the um, presentation that between um, infancy and um, high school, there's a, that um, kind of drop off. Um, has there really, has there been um, much investigation of 
what some factors are. Is it something prenatally? Is it something um, during that kindergarten phase? Is it um, early at childhood education? Is, um, is there a lot of uh, work being done to, to find that out? The data that we have on our early Head Start, Head Start children, uh, we are really seeing the effects of families not reading to their children, nor are they having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with their children. Uh, we have an over-income classroom as well, and we can see the difference between our early Head Start and Head Start versus the over-income families. And the over-income families are reading and they're talking to their children. And we see that at a very early age that that's impacting them. And as we follow them, that does not increase. They're behind in reading and math from a very young age due to uh, family, the literacy development. And it, it's heartbreaking knowing that families do not, aren't even aware that they're placing their children on that failure trajectory at a very young age due to something that we can do. And there's not enough time in our early childhood program for us to be spending. We really need to partner with our families. I think that's the conclusion I was meeting with my supervisor, Robert Matt, a month ago, and I said, you know, we are seeking those dollars and those partnerships to support that pipeline. I said, there's a missing piece, and that's our families helping to support that movement along that pipeline. And he fully agreed and uh, certainly was not surprised by that uh, conclusion. Pearl, we can talk offline too, and I'd, I'd refer anyone also to the uh, link to last year's conference on that topic, and we've got it all, a lot of it on video and stuff, so, but I'm happy to talk to you. We do a lot in that area too. Okay, our final right. question here. Yep. All right, I'm gonna go quick. Jesse Lackey again, I said hey yesterday, or OCO really. Um, and I'm a graduate student at the U, so son of the Cherokee Nation. Um, just one comment, we're having a lot of discussion around gender, and I really advise you guys um, to open up your options as to how you're identifying or gendering your students. Um, these younger generations, my generation, and older generations, even though it's probably not as much talked about, um, there is people are identifying as more than one gender, whether that's two-spirit among our native students or genderqueer um, or um, non-binary gender. And so I'm looking at your statistics and it's male-female. Um, so if you are the first people, and, and even with the LGBTQ community, a lot of these students are coming out when they go to college. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not welcomed at home, it's happening um, as their undergrads, as their graduate students, it's happening. And if you're gonna be the welcoming face to them, please also identify and recognize these other students that um, you know, kind of fall between the gaps sometimes or that we forget about. Um, the other thing is, is that I'm loving all this talk about community building and especially with undergraduate students. Again, um, please keep track of your graduate students. Um, they have different needs. Communities can fall apart in the graduate school. Um, if there's a native community at the university level, it doesn't mean that they're reaching graduate students at the college level. And then the last thing that I have is um, mental health resources, um, connecting students to that. Um, mental health is a huge issue um, among students and we need to make sure that students are thriving and not just surviving um, as they're going through college. And again, that's both at the undergraduate and graduate level and probably postdoc level as well. So, or at any level. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's okay. uh, true. Now, I'll, I'll make it quick. I'm Nikki, and I also work here at the Center for Indian Country Development, and I've learned a lot just in the last uh, couple hours this morning. I just wanted to circle back a few conversations to just talk about that significance of that cohort or networking or peer-to-peer, -peer, um, I guess, model. 
I actually went through College Horizons and Graduate Horizons, um, and I'll date myself, that's okay. Almost 15 years ago, I went through as a high school junior 16 years ago, and I would say that in my, like on my res, I'm from the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa here in Minnesota, and amongst my friends, nobody was talking about going to college. Um, nobody had really in my family talked about that much besides my parents. So I went to Santa Fe that year, I, I'm still friends with uh, that, that cohort or my group uh, that I went through that program with, or College Horizons. And so we started talking about it, and what does that look like? And then my mother and my grandmother uh, drove to Santa Fe, met with other families of these other College Horizon uh, participants, and then they were sharing stories. And so that was uh, very important to me. I would say that's like a third of the reason that I'm, I'm here right now. Um, and then fast forward a few years, same conversation, Graduate Horizons. Um, no one had been talking about that in my circle of friends, even those, many of those who had gone on to uh, undergrad. So anyways, I uh, ended up meeting a friend there um, who's actually from the Fond du Lac community here in Minnesota. We're really good friends now, but she and I talked all summer after that three-day program um, to figure out, are we going to law school? Are we going to public policy school? What do we want to do? So. That really um, had a big uh, impact, so I just wanted to say thank you, specifically uh, Carmen and that program. But it is very important, not just for our students having that peer-to-peer, -peer, but for our families, too, to talk to other families. Thank you. Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank all of our endless speakers. Okay.